Welcome, everybody. Thank you for being here. Uh, this is our Business Faith and Common Good Symposium that we do every year. This is the sixth year that we've done it. And uh, it's nice to have a good crowd for the first session. So thank you for coming out. Uh, this, if you haven't got a program, I can, I'll pass them out in a second. We've got the bios of the speakers who are going to be talking to you today. And in this first session, we have a couple of good friends of mine. One is Tom Beal from Kids for Life. And then we have my HVAC guy, my heating, plumbing, my heating and cooling guy, uh, Jim Abraham, who got stuck on an air conditioner, but he's on his way. I just him. So he'll, he'll be here in a minute. And he said, do I have to dress up? And I said, Jim, just come as you are. So he'll be here momentarily, but they're both great Christian guys. Um, but before we start, um, I wanted to let Dean Tony Hendrickson come and share a few words. I always get great support from Tony um, for these events, and uh, his leadership has been great. He and I came to Creighton at the same time, a little bit over 14 years ago, and I've been grateful to have him as a dean the whole time. So thank you for being here. Thanks. Thanks, Andy. Well, uh, on behalf of the university and on behalf of uh, Father Hendrickson, uh, let me welcome you to Creighton's campus. Anybody not been on Creighton's campus before? Oh, that's good. Okay, so we're amongst friends. Uh, but typically, there will be some people that will be joining us this afternoon and might be their first time here. So uh, appreciate you coming and doing this. This is really an important uh, symposium that we do. Uh, it's kind of a culmination. We don't do this just in the symposium. Uh, we try to integrate and we try to encourage faculty to integrate their faith on a daily basis in the classroom. But this is a chance for us to bring outside speakers in uh, that aren't always joining us and for us really to focus up about how our faith and spend some deliberate time, intentional time on how our faith impacts and, and, uh, and that directs the things that we want to do and uh, relative to our business. And so uh, it makes us a unique institution uh, and certainly different from secular institutions because we get to be able to share our faith and talk about how uh, God impacts our lives and therefore directs uh, all aspects of our lives in, in various ways and especially our, our business ways. And so we definitely want people to understand that we're not just people, separate people in business during the week and then on Sunday we're suddenly <laughs> believers and uh, so we act differently. We, we think that part of being a, a Jesuit institution in education, a whole person in integration of, of those values means that it's something, it's who we are 24 seven all the time. And so we try and talk about that. I thought about a number of different things to kind of lead off here. Uh, typically, uh, we start all of our meetings with a reflection, um, president's council, just about every meeting that we do on campus uh, starts with a reflection. And so uh, we have President's Council Monday and um, the nursing dean will do the reflection. We have the dean's council on Monday that will start with a reflection. So that's part of our ethos. And I kind of have a short reflection here. Um, as I was thinking about a number of things that I could talk about, about virtue signaling in the society that we see today and and some of the other aspects and challenges that we have. There's a lot of aspects of how our faith is interacting with business and, and the pressures of, of, of all kinds of societal issues of income inequality and social justice, et cetera. Not saying those aren't important, but uh, this just kind of spoke to me. One of the big things that those that know, know me uh, know that I'm kind of big about people being judgmental. And uh, I probably think about that because I'm probably the most judgmental person there is. So, uh, so often it, it, it tweaks something in me because um, I, every time I see something like that, this that I'm gonna share, it kind of drives home with me because, um, because I'm really speaking to me maybe more than anybody else because I'm really quick to be judgmental about something with somebody or so here drive down the highway next to me and I don't like the way you drive. My wife hates the way I edit. She's like, can't you just be quiet about that? <laughs> <laughs> um, but I will share, you may have seen this. It's, uh, I saw it on social media, but I, I really loved it. Uh, 
uh, especially the last uh, part of it. And uh, so I'll share. It's called The Best Poem in the World. I was shocked and confused, bewildered, as I entered heaven's door, not by the beauty of it all, nor the lights or its decor. But it was the folks in heaven who made me sputter and gasp. The thieves, the liars, the sinners, the alcoholics, and the trash. There stood the kid from seventh grade who swiped my lunch money twice. Next to him was my old neighbor who never said anything nice. Bob, who I always thought was rotting away in hell, was sitting pretty on cloud nine, looking incredibly well. I nudged Jesus. What's the deal? I'd love to hear your take. How do all these sinners get up here? God must have made a mistake. And why is everyone so quiet, so somber? Give me a clue. Hush, child, he said. They're all in shock. No one thought they'd be seeing you. <laughs> Judge not. Remember, just going to church doesn't make you a Christian any more than standing in your garage makes you a car. This is the part that I like best. Every saint has a past. Every sinner has a future. So, good luck. Enjoy the afternoon. So the format of this is we go pretty much from 2 to about 250, 3 to about 350, and 4 to about 450. There's going to be questions and answers uh, for the last 10 minutes or so. And I want to jump right in and give you plenty of time, even though Jim's not here yet. He's on his way. He's on California Street driving quickly, so hopefully he didn't get a ticket. But uh, we'll start out with you, Tom. Very good. I've known Tom for a number of years. I've had my MBA class go down to his store before, and he's just a stand-up guy. He's a deacon in the church. He used to help fly B-52s. I did. He has a, quite an amazing background in the military before he came here to get a trip to life. We're grateful for you to be here. Thank, Thank you me. very much. So I got I got to move the microphone, and you got to let me know if it gets too loud. I was uh, you could ask my mother; she'll tell you the volume comes from three years of being colic when I was a baby. Uh, so when most mothers in, endure maybe a couple of weeks or months, she endured three years of that. And my wife, who's sitting back there, can attest that I'm probably still colic a little bit. So the best way to start this is I, I got to ask you the question, and this is really where we need to challenge ourselves. If somebody would have come up to you and say to you, what is your story? Could you tell them your story? Could you help them to understand not only who you are, but how you got where you are today? Could you do that? And the, the reason I say that is because I always go back in my own mind and even in my own life to the idea that I'm just a kid from Brooklyn. And so let me give you a little bit of what I'm talking about and then we'll move forward to where I am today and how a little bit of that journey. I've got to do this relatively quickly, so I'm going to leap forward quickly, as you'll notice, but I want you to get the highlight. So I was born and raised in Brooklyn, New York, a cradle Catholic, went to St. Bridget's, uh, which was right down the block. We literally had to walk to church kind of thing. Went to PS86, which is a public school, half a block from my house. And there were seven of us that lived in four rooms, not four bedrooms, but four rooms in this apartment in Brooklyn. And there wasn't a lot of money, but everybody in that community was fairly poor, so it didn't matter. You were one of everybody else. And when everybody else is kind of like you, it doesn't seem odd or different. But then when I got to high school, for whatever reason, and my father passed away uh, seven years ago, even on his deathbed, I said, please explain to me the move. I don't get it. So in 1977, he, 75, he decided that he was going to move the entire family from Brooklyn, New York, and picture all of that dynamic in your head to a little tiny town, which is still very little, in southern Arizona. So I went from all that is offered in New York, we used to have field trips to Manhattan. We used to go to Museum of Natural History, Central Park, Empire State Building, all of those amazing things. That was our field trip from school to this little tiny town that offered a movie theater, and that was it. And I sat there and wondered, what, what am I doing and why am I doing this? And how do I go from where I was to where I am? 
And then to make matters worse, and maybe some of you can relate to this, after making this dramatic move from New York to Arizona, my father was laid off. So now we go from being poor to being destitute. We literally lived in a trailer that was eventually repossessed, had holes in the floor to where when you walked in where the washer and dryer should be, I could see the desert ground. And I remember one time, you know, if young people say, you know, there's nothing to eat in a house. What that means is there's lots in a house, but there's nothing I want. But when I tell you there was nothing to eat in a house, and this is kind of gross, I get that. But I can remember one day walking in and opening a cabinet, and the only thing that was in there was a nest of roaches. And so this is kind of where I was now being developed, if you will. By this time, I'm about 15 years old, paying about a third of the family's bills, but also trying to be a high school kid. And as I'm trying to be a high school kid, um, I'm going through the throes of everybody, what everybody else does in high school, trying to meet somebody, and I met somebody. I met Lisa in 1977. So we've known each other as of August for 42 years. And yes, she's still with me. Um, so there's a special place in heaven for her because she's had to put up with me. And so here we met. And if there's anything I got from that, I would say that is probably the only reason I was there. Because there's really nothing that brings me back to that location. And so by the time I was in my junior year, I was a failing student. Literally couldn't pass history, barely passed the other courses, because I was trying to balance life. And I'm assuming that most, if not all of you, can recognize what that means. You try to balance life. But how do you do that when you're trying to pay bills as an adult, be a kid on a baseball team, and just trying to do the typical high school stuff? And how do you do that? And so I failed my junior year. So now I'm going into my senior year, and I vividly remember this moment. I walked into the cafeteria, and for some reason I decided that I wanted to get into AP English. And somehow, one of the instructors found out about that. And at that time, as they still do, teachers often work other jobs to make a little bit more money, and he happened to be working the register in the cafeteria. And I went out to pay for my lunch at the register. And he said to me, hey, Tom, I hear that you're thinking about getting into AP English. Is that true? And I said, well, I was thinking about it. He goes, don't waste anybody's time, especially ours. You don't belong there. In fact, you're going to be lucky to get through high school. Just accept that fact, and you'll be happier for the rest of your life. And he said this as loud as I just said it in a cafeteria. And I sat there and thought about that for a minute. And you know, when you're hit with something like that, your thought is, what if he's right? What if I am just a poor kid from Brooklyn that was transplanted to this place where I can't seem to get my footing? What if he's right? What do you do with that? And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, and I literally mean out of nowhere, one of the teachers named Dorothea Brown, and I will never, ever, ever, ever forget her name, comes up to me and says, Tom, you're going to be in my class, AP English. And to this day, I have no idea how she found out about me. Never spoke to her, never got near her. She was kind of one of those really weird teachers that everybody made fun of. And the best I saw was at a distance. You know what I mean? She even had kind of an ape-looking face, like her mouth protruded. I mean, it was a weird-looking person who I wouldn't have known. I just didn't know her. But here's what she said to me. I don't care if you're poor, destitute, crying, unhealthy, whatever. No excuses. You will perform end of discussion. If you can agree to that, you can be in my AP class. And I thought to myself, well, I have a choice. I can either agree to that or accept his position. And thank God I agreed with that. And in that year, I went from a failing student to a 3.9 student. And I graduated uh, to some level with honors, if you will. From that point forward, and I say this not in a braggart way, so please don't hear that. Since that time, I've earned five college degrees, including three masters. And I would love to go back to that teacher and say, 
Remember when you dismissed me? The real question is, how many others did you dismiss that listened to what you said and agreed with you? How many did you do that to? The more important question is, how many other Miss Browns are out there that grab somebody and say, no, I don't care what everybody else is saying, you have value and you're going to do that. She was so impactful. When I went to college the very, the very next year, they, you know, when you go in an English class and they say, just write something because they want to see where everybody is, what's your talent, what's your skill set. And I wrote a paper and afterwards the teacher said, I need to talk to you after class, Tom. So I'm thinking he's going to put me in like some basic class for like, you know, not very bright people. And, I, and I'm really thinking that because of, I'm still stuck where this other guy was. And he comes up to me and he says, you had Miss Brown for English, didn't you? He said, yes, I did. How do you know? He said, I could tell by your writing. You talk about an impactful person. That's amazing. The second part of that story is, what is your gut telling you for where you are and where you want to be? The other part of my story goes back to second grade, when for whatever reason, no military in my family, no flyers in my family. The only time we ever went to an airport was to pick up my grandmother when she happened to be traveling somewhere. Other than that, nowhere were we found. And in that gut, I decided I wanted to fly airplanes for the Air Force. And to this day, I can't tell you why. But as I grew up, there were teachers along the way who allowed me to kind of nurture that a little bit. Fast forward, I graduated from college, University of Arizona, joined the military, flew B-52s as a navigator, and then retired as a colonel after 26 years. And in the throes of all that time, I always found myself in a position where, more importantly, I could be that Miss Brown to somebody else. And so part of the challenge when you approach it from a Christian perspective or a faith-based perspective, however you want to say that, you always look for the opportunity of not what somebody did to you negatively, but you look for the positive influence and say, how can I replicate that? Because along the way, whenever somebody would help me and I would turn to them and say, how do I thank you? Invariably, they would say to me, just do what I did for you for somebody else. And so my whole thing has been development. I did it in the Air Force. I do it in the church. And I do it in Chick-fil-A now. And the only reason I'm in Chick-fil-A, it's not because I have this grand desire to own a restaurant. Because if anybody's ever worked in one, that's hard work. People can be pretty, let's say, interesting. <laughs> let's just use that word, okay? They can be very interesting. And so it's really not for that, but rather what we do in the restaurant is we grow and nurture, nurture young people who we ensure they understand that we view you not just as a worker, but as a young professional who are starting their career. And the foundation starts here. And now, and then we grow them from the time they come in, some as young as 14 years old, to the time they leave us with the idea that if you leave us to go to just another restaurant, we have failed. But rather, you leave going out and up. Now, I could tell you a lot more than that, but my partner is here, so I'm going to leave him some time. And then we, I believe we'll start questions at about 2.35, 2.40. If you have any additional, let me know. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. And Jim did show up. So we're, we appreciate you being here, Jim. Uh, I have a number of rental properties, and Jim is my go-to guy when I have a furnace down or an AC. And he's one of the kindest, most generous people that I know. Um, and I think uh, there's a lot of people that know that about him. He also does a lot of volunteer work on the side. He does prison ministry. He's been doing that for years and years. He and his wife live in Venus Park, so they're here in the neighborhood. It's great, and we're really glad to have you here. So thanks for coming. One of the things I want to emphasize is always be on time. <laughs> <laughs> My wife has always been five minutes late, no matter what I do. I get up at 4 o'clock in the morning, and I have a quiet time, spend some time with the Lord, I leave early for work, and somehow, for the rest of the day, I'm always a little bit late. So, please forgive me. It's absolutely no lack of respect for 
and here for you people that have come here. My story is a lot like Tom's, uh, except I partied out of college. Uh, I had the ability, and I knew I had the ability, but I also grew up in a poor family. My parents were, uh, my mother was a teacher, school teacher in Omaha Public Schools, and you all know they don't make any money. And my father worked in the union shops as a carpenter for the Union Pacific Railroad. So we always had very, very little. Growing up, we didn't know we had very, very little. And so that was okay. We went to church. We, I grew up in the Orthodox Church, which is very, very much like the Catholic Church for those of you that are Catholic. The only difference between the Orthodox Church and the Catholic Church is the Orthodox Church is ruled by a council of bishops rather than the Pope. And though they venerate Mary, not quite to the, to the extent that the Catholic Church does. The church brought me right to the foot of the cross. I love the Lord. I love my church. I love my faith. And I was excited about being a Christian man. And when I finished Sunday school, instead of saying, you just need to accept Christ as your Savior and give your life to him, they said, welcome to the church. And I walked into a church that was full of people, just like non-church people. They leave the church and they use the Lord's name in vain. They go to work and they cheat people. And it just destroyed my image of who God was. And I thought, if this is the church that taught me about God, what am I missing? And yet I read the Bible every day. I had a cousin who was the closest friend I ever had. And I read, and he started reading the Bible a chapter a day at the age of 14. And I loved him and respected him. And I thought, well, I can do that. We were born 11 days apart. And so I started reading the Bible every day, one chapter a day. I was very diligent about that. You could not tell that I ever read the Bible. Growing up in grade school, I was uh, uh, bullied, and uh, I was a wimp. And so I became a habitual liar. If you... If you were an intellectual, I would try to be an intellectual so I'd fit in with you. If you were an athlete, I'd try to be an athlete and talk sports so that I'd fit in with you. The problem was, as I tried to fit in with everybody, I lost out on who I was. And because I lied so much, I couldn't even remember what was true. And then I became a thief because when I was going to college, and I did go to college, uh, for a few weeks, and uh, <laughs> but I had to work while I was going to school, and I enjoyed college, but I enjoyed the fraternity, and I enjoyed the parties, and I enjoyed playing bridge in the student union, and I was smart enough to be an average bridge player. I just forgot to go to class, and universities frown on that. <laughs> so for me, this is a great honor that I can be he who flunked out and come and speak to those who I hope will not. Um, what happened in my life after that, I, I married a beautiful woman. She was a sweet Catholic girl, and I mean she was sweet. She was the best thing that ever happened to me. I was the worst thing that ever happened to her. <laughs> because I couldn't love me, I, could, I didn't know how to love her. And I always wanted to be like Tom, a successful <laughs> businessman, and I wanted to have a, an office in a big, uh, like the uh, Woodman Tower with a big oak desk and a big leather chair and say, hey, go out there and do this and make me some money, and you go do that and make me some money. <laughs> Problem is, you have to get an education to do that. So when I started working, um, after I got out of college, left college, they, they showed me the door. Um, Vietnam was going on. And I decided I was going to volunteer so I could pick uh, a profession that maybe I could do in life later on. And so I, I volunteered to go to personnel management school. Military was wonderful for me. It taught me some discipline which had never been a part of my life. And I did very well in the military. And I was fortunate enough, every guy in my class in personnel school went to Vietnam. I did not. I ended up going to Germany and through a lot of things that take too much time to even matter to you. Um, I had a really good job at Heidelberg, Germany, working at headquarters U.S. Army Europe. And I was an E-5 sergeant, just a buck sergeant with no, 
you know, fancy stuff at the bottom of my, of my stripes. But I ended up working in an E8 slot, which is a master sergeant, three grades above my, my uh, uh, title. And, and I performed adequately there. But all through that time, I still didn't know how to love my wife. I still didn't know how to be a real man. I, I was able to do push-ups. I could do 100 push-ups if you just said, hey, do 100. Today, I could do one, maybe. <laughs> uh, but as time went on, our marriage started falling apart. In the Orthodox Church, was much like the Catholics, we didn't believe in divorce. And one day, I looked at my wife and I said, either we're going to fix this, or we're going to be miserable for the rest of our lives. And we both knew that what was missing in our life was God. So we started studying. And my brother and sister had become Jehovah Witnesses, and they'd seen a, a big change in their life. And the Bible says, you'll know my people by their works, by how they love one another. And I thought, wow, they've really changed. They, you know, they quit smoking and doing drugs and different things and became really good people. And so we started studying with them. And now... The years of reading my Bible came back. And when they'd say, would a loving God have a hell and send somebody there for eternity with no hope? It doesn't make sense. And I thought, it doesn't make sense. But the hair on the back of my head stood up because the Bible very clearly talks about hell. It says, pluck your eye out. It's better to pluck your eye out and enter heaven maimed than go to hell. And then my cousin, who started reading the Bible, called me up and we got together, he and his wife and my wife and I, and he said, Jim, do you believe you're a sinner? No problem there. <laughs> Definitely I knew I was a sinner. Uh, and even my wife, who was really sweet and kind and wonderful, knew she was a sinner. And he said, do you believe Christ died for you? And I thought, well, he died for everybody. He said, no, he died for you. And if you can believe that he died for you and paid the price for your sins, surrender your life to him and begin to pursue God and give him the control of your life. I thought that makes sense. The air in the back of my head didn't stand up, and I had real calm come over. And my wife and I both prayed February 1st, 1975, and asked Jesus to be the Lord of our life. And everything got worse. <laughs> Did I say worse? Worse. Because all my old sins and all of my past just kind of regurgitated up, and I had to face everything. And, I, and, and the pain that I caused my wife didn't just immediately go away. And then I started, uh, can I see that over here? I was going to a good church. I actually don't need the microphone. <laughs> I was going to a good church, and, and they had daily breads there. And they said, you have to have time with the Lord every day. Well, by that time, I had four children. And a dad with four children and a job doesn't have a quiet time. But, and I kept saying, yeah, I know, but I just don't have any time. And finally, somebody came up to me, and they said, hey, this says read five verses in a little story. If you don't have time for that, don't tell anybody you love the Lord. I thought, well, you know, maybe. And I said, I don't know how I can get away by myself. And they said, well, forgive the crassness. When you go to the bathroom in the morning, the kids come into the bathroom. I said, oh, no. I put my Bible in the bathroom. I put the daily bread in the bathroom. And every morning I'd read a little bit in the Bible and, and I'd read the daily bread. I'm 71 years old. I still have a Bible in my bathroom. Because I got to go. I might, as well, I might as well concentrate on something more pleasant. So if I were to tell you the best thing that ever happened in my life, it would first be the February 1st, 1975, when I gave my life to Christ. It would second be on June 14th, 1969, when I married my wife. And by the way, we're still married, too. Uh, today, she'll tell you she has a good husband. It took 30 years before she believed that. It took 35 before I believed it. But I began to pursue her. And if you, men and women, if you have a Bible at home, there's 31 chapters in the book of Proverbs. 
It's a book of wisdom. It was written by Solomon to his sons and, and to be politically correct, and I'm sure his daughters, on how to live a good life, how to have a prosperous life, and what to avoid in life. Today's the 13th, you read Proverbs 13. If you get in the habit of reading the proverb of the day, whatever the date of the month is, read that proverb. It will bless you. Uh, yes, I do go to the jail and talk to prisoners. They bless me. I was asked to do that. I thought they were crazy. Uh, in fact, it's uncomfortable for me because the doors aren't locked. It's a lot easier to talk to people who are locked in. You <laughs> 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 get up and leave. But they read the daily bread every day, and they read the proverb of the day every day. And at that point, I was not. And I thought, well, if they do that, I can do that too, so that I, I understand what they're reading and what they're learning. I started to read the proverbs of the day every day. That was back in 1994. And I have read proverbs almost every day since 1994. You think I have it memorized. I do not. You think I know it by heart. I do not. I know some of it. But what I do know is that in the year 2019, on September 13, I found something new that didn't stand out to me. And I continue to find new things as I read through Proverbs. And for a man, if you're not reading Proverbs, you will never, you will never be all you can be. And I mean that because there's so much knowledge and wisdom in Proverbs. For example, Proverbs 25, 11 says, a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold and pictures of silver. Well, when I'm out in the streets and I hear people speaking, I don't hear very many apples of gold. I hear some of the filthiest language imaginable. And my wife and I both talk that way until February 1st, 1975. And we didn't think about, hey, we got to quit cussing. We didn't think we got to clean up our language. It was gone. I mean, it was just gone. About two weeks into our new life, I said, Barbara, are, are you trying not to quote swear? And she said, no. I said, I'm not either. But we're not doing it. Another uh, verse in Proverbs says, that what's in your heart is what comes out of your mouth. And we had a filthy heart. And God gave me a new heart. And now my language is different. Proverbs 9.10 says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. You think you're coming to college for wisdom. No, you're coming here for knowledge. Wisdom comes from God. And you have to pursue knowledge. Uh, pursue wisdom. And wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. Proverbs continually talks about wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. Um, another one of my favorite verses in Proverbs is uh, Proverbs 6, 16 through 19. These six things that the Lord hates, yea, seven are an abomination to him. It's okay. God hates these six things. Seven of them are an abomination to the Lord. A proud look is the first one. A proud look. A lying tongue. Then hands that shed innocent blood. Murder's third on the list. A heart that devises wicked imaginations. Feet that are swift and running to mischief. A false witness which is lying. Lying is mentioned twice. Um, he that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among the brethren. Gossip. Talking behind somebody's back. There is nothing in there about abortion. There's nothing in there about uh, uh, atheists. There's nothing in there about stealing. There's nothing in there. You know, the, the Ten Commandments are still the Ten Commandments. And God wants us to live by those, but these seven things he hates. And later on in Proverbs, it says pride goes before the fall. And as you see people in our politics today, they are so puffed up and they're so full of themselves, both sides of the aisle, that they want their way. And if it's not going to be their way, by golly, nobody's getting their way. Puffed up in our country, founded on godly principles, is falling apart. And if 
anything, you can do three things. Pursue God with all your heart. Everything will be better. Second, tell the truth. In my business, I hired my grandson. I was really excited. He graduated from high school. I bought all his tools. He went to the uh, heating and air conditioning class. And he got bounced out for smoking marijuana. So his dad said, go to work for Grandpa and learn that way. So he came to work for me, and he was a good worker, and he's a nice kid. And I told all the people that were working for me, there's one thing that you cannot do and work for me. You cannot lie. Do not lie to me. Do not lie to my customers. If I catch you lying, I will fire you. There's no second chance. If you lie, you're a liar. He lied to me about something not having anything to do with work, something he had done in his personal time that got him in trouble. And he lied about it. And I fired him. And I want to tell you, every employee I've ever had before or since knows I'm serious. Don't like him. And it hurt me more than it hurt him. My son, his father, now works for me. And he knows, don't lie to dad. <laughs> and I told him before he started, I don't want to hurt our relationship, but I want you to know, I'm the boss. I love you no matter what you do. If you screw up, I'll love you, but I'm the boss and you have to respect me at work. And he does. He also taught his kids, and he hasn't lived by this yet himself, totally. But he's, and there's a verse in Proverbs that, that verifies that. He said, um, uh, Proverbs 13, 20, He that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. If you want to be wise, if you want to be spiritual, not religious, if you want to be religious, go to any church in town. But if you want to be spiritual, pursue God with your whole heart, and then the church you go to doesn't matter. God will lead you where he needs you. But if you believe that Jesus Christ died for your sins, he's paid the price for you, how can you not live for him? What kind of a cold-hearted person are you that he, you would let his death for you go unacknowledged? In my whole life, I, we, we had a car. When we were going to church, you knew we were coming three blocks away. We didn't have a muffler. We couldn't afford one. And it was a horrible piece of junk. And my kids were in the back seat and I turned around to yell at them and I saw the pavement going by. And I thought, kids shouldn't be in a car with the pavement. But I had just started in the heating and air conditioning, so I got some sheet metal and I, I screwed it down on the floor so my kids wouldn't fall to the floor. <laughs> so I know really well what it's like to be poor. We had roaches in our house growing up. Uh, we had some tough times. My kids don't know that. I mean, they, today when I say, you don't know how hard it was when, we, when you were growing up. But Dad, we had new clothes. You treated us really good. We, I mean, we got to join sports. We weren't poor. We'd take pop bottles back at the end of the month. In the old days, you got a refund for taking pop bottles back to, to use to buy milk and diapers. Today, I'm blessed beyond belief. And it started when I stopped just going to church and started trying to live for Jesus Christ. Just to be clear, when you want to be like Christ, look at what Christ was like. They brought a prostitute to him and wanted him to acknowledge, yeah, she should be stoned to death. And he did. That's what the law said. But he also said, you who are without sin, cast the first stone. And beginning with the oldest, they dropped the stones and walked away. Now, you guys are college students. Why would it be beginning with the oldest? Because the older you are, the more sins you have in your life. And finally, they all walked away. And he didn't say what you did is okay. He said, go and sin no more. And every time he called someone to follow him, the ones that followed him got up and they totally followed him. They changed their whole life. 
Jesus was the first woman's liver. He honored women. Jesus was the first to not be judgmental of other people's sins. And he said he was dying for everyone. There's a verse in the New Testament that says that the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Everyone in this room will do that. And it will be so exciting if you believe that he's your Lord before you meet him. If you live to please him before you meet him. Osama bin Laden will bow and call Jesus Christ Lord. Hitler will call Jesus Christ Lord. Atheists, Buddhists, Muslims, even some Christians will all bow and their tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And I'll add, he's my Savior and my friend. I hope you can do that too someday. And then if there are any questions for these fellows about how they run their businesses, for their common good, or for how their faith affects it, are there any questions you'd like to ask, either one, Tom or Jim? One thing I'd like you to share, if you've got a thought or an experience where it was a challenging experience, but you felt like your faith somehow gave you an idea of what to do in that circumstance, right? Yeah. Um, well, to tell you the truth, we kind of we kind of face that every day because uh, whenever you're in business, um, for so many people in the business world, essentially what happens is the drive for greater success or more money um, can easily overshadow everything else you're doing. So from the very beginning, and I'm very fortunate to have a bunch of leaders who agree with the perspective is what we simply did was we flipped the normal model upside down. So the normal model in business is if you work for me, I don't care what you do outside and I don't care what your belief system is in, just help me grow the business. But we flipped that upside down. So essentially the priority, whenever we bring somebody in, was faith and family is number one. We need to make sure that you have that right. And then once we follow that, the second priority is education. And we will do everything we can to modify the schedule to make sure that you are not compromising one or two. And then, and only then, when we get those right, will the business follow. And so uh, when I first initiated that and, and introduced that, there were a lot of people um, who weren't used to that kind of a, a presentation or philosophy immediately dismissed it and felt that, that I wouldn't be successful in the long run. Um, what's interesting about that, if you know anything about retail or that whole industry, uh, just drive around the greater Omaha area and you'll see the vast majority of them almost on a regular basis, if not daily basis, have no hiring signs. In the seven years that I've been open, I've never had to put a no hiring sign. In fact, all of the people, literally all of the people that work for me are referred in from other people who either do work for me now or have worked for me before. And so even though it looked like initially and often ridiculed by people that we got the, we flipped the priorities wrongly where we should have business first, it actually has served us very, very well in the long run to where the people coming in understand who we are and what we're about and then when they're being interviewed, instead of saying, we'll let you know if we select you, we turn it around and I literally look them in the face and say, now that you know who we are and what our belief system is, do you, do you select us? And by doing those things in what seems to be the backward direction, we've had a lot of success. Um, I actually hired somebody to work for you. Oh. <laughs> Except in my business, I don't have that freedom. Like last night, we worked 13 hours. The day before, we worked 12. I'm 71 years old. My body keeps saying, hey, stupid. <laughs> but uh, that's how it is. And, and that's how we work me because we work too many hours. But a fine young man. And I've never been to a Chick fil A that I, I wasn't impressed with their help and, and felt like I was really special. You do an excellent job of your training. With me, 
Um, I had a man that was working for me. He was a retired guy. When I first got started, I started my business from scratch. God and I made a partnership. He was a senior partner, and I was the guy that did all the work. And that has saved my tail so many times. And so I have time for two stories. If and they're quick. Long. Yeah. About okay. five minutes late, Jim. <laughs> so the first story, uh, a guy that his son played football with my son. My work was really slow. It was a slow time. It was in the winter. He called me up and he said, hey, Jim, uh, my furnace quit working. The motor's bad. It made a terrible noise and I shut it off. Do you have a motor? I said, yeah. And he said, well, can you bring the motor and come fix my furnace? At six o'clock at night. I'm excited because I'm out of money and I have this business account and my personal account. And, you know, I've already paid for the motor, so I'm, I'm going to make maybe $200, and it's all going to be positive cash flow. Got to his house, went downstairs. He said, do you have a motor? I said, yeah, I got a motor. I went downstairs, and I spun the bullet wheel, and it was gone. And I looked inside the sets for the thing. But repositioned the bullet wheel on the motor, tightened the set screw, spun the thing. Turned it on, and it I'm sitting there, and my old Jim Abraham said, well, you know, that's probably damaged the motor. It's an older furnace. He's already expecting to buy a motor. But then my senior boss said, you don't need this. So I went upstairs, and I said, I've got good news and bad news. He said, well, what's the bad news? I said, you don't need a motor. He said, what's the good news? Or he said, what's the good news? I said, you don't need a motor. He said, what's the bad news? I said, you don't need a motor. <laughs> <laughs> and it was bad news for me. But I took care of it. He gave my name out so many times. Down the Second story, we were doing a, a furnace install. And it was for a home warranty. And you don't make very much money working for home warranty people. And we, we, I wasn't there when the furnace was delivered. I got there a little bit later, and the homeowner wasn't there. And my helper said, and he's a 70 year old guy, and he said, uh, The homeowner's really mad. He said, You scratched her cabinet. He said, I don't think you did that. But she said, Her dad made the cabinet, and Ann made it for him, and she's just really upset. She came home while I was there, and I looked at it, and it did not look me. And uh, I said, I understand that maybe we scratched your cabinet. Didn't make it a question, did we scratch? I said, I understand you may have scratched your, your uh, cabinet. And she said, yes, my dad made that for me. And, and she started her, her tirade. She said, excuse me. If I gave you $300, do you think you could fix it today? Now, I know for you know $5.95, I could get some old English and make it go away. I offered her $300. Yes, I mean, it doesn't have to be, I said, no, $300. My helper heard that. He was livid. And when I went downstairs and she left again, he said, if I can fix that for less than that. I said, so can I. But every time she looks at that cabinet, she's going to be mad at us. Now, every time she looks at that cabinet, she's going to think, well, he, they're really good people. I went back there six months later to work under air conditioning. Scratch was so there. She didn't even buy any old. <laughs> <laughs> but it's all right, my conscience. Good. Any final questions? Well, you'll get a chance probably to talk with them if you want, and you stay for the reception afterwards. But thanks a lot for being here, fellas. Really yeah, thank you. Thanks for uh, being here. This is our second session today in the business space and common good symposium. <laughs> If you weren't here at the beginning, this is the sixth year that we've done this symposium. We typically bring in different entrepreneurs and business people uh, for whom either faith or a pursuit of the common good motivates and uh, sort of inspires what they do in business. Uh, the first session was more about how faith affects business. Uh, in this one, we're going to hear from two different people that have different perspectives on sort of alternate models of doing business. One is B Corps. You've probably heard of B Corps before in some of your classes. And um, we've got uh, Justin Abadie that's here from Physician Strive that's going to share about that. Then we'll hear from John, and I'll introduce him afterwards from the, the economy of community perspective. Justin has spoke at a lot of different universities around the country. He uh, deals with physicians and with medical students, helping them to think through what their financial needs are and also some of the legal uh, background issues that they maybe have unique to 
being a physician. So we're grateful you being here, and thanks a lot. What was this symposium when I was back in college, back in 2000, 2000, 2005? We never had anything like this. So I feel grateful. And, you know, even just listening to some of our speakers, like I, I'm, I'm going to walk out of here a better person than I was when I came in because of what you shared. So I thank you for what you shared. Um, I, I use the silk on the pot and digest good material all the time. So I'm, I'm, I'm with you, there, brother. <laughs> So I'm Justin, I'm an entrepreneur, I'm a husband, father, a philanthropist, and I am recently have become a triathlete. Uh, last weekend, I did my first half, well, a half distance Ironman uh, race, and so that was a fun experience in Minnesota. And so if you haven't plugged into something like that, I would say that it is worth the experience. So definitely check it out. If I look at my past experience and the pivotal moments of my life, it would have been in the same place that you are now. And that is not knowing what I was going to do or where I was going to go or what things were going to look like, but having a belief that there was something out there that I could pursue. And after college, got into business and um, got to a place where I was kind of stuck a little bit. Didn't really know what was what the future was going to hold. And so what I decided to do was just start praying, start going hard in prayer to the Lord to figure out what the path might be. And um, he answered with providing clarity around what we could do in terms of helping physicians. And so that's what started our Physicians Thrive business was we found that doctors are the people that you kind of think have things figured out. They should, right? Because they're super smart. They got through med school and their focus is on medicine and they should be pretty much smart at everything else, right? Not so much. Not because they can, but because of time, right? And, and their focus. And so uh, we found that they needed help being educated, but then on top of that, they need an advocate to, to stand up for them because they, are, they have a target on their back. And so they're constantly fighting challenges with that. And so got the business going in 2009 and had it running for about five years, went through a lot of challenges. And it wasn't until we got crystal clear on what our core values were that everything would, would, you know, live or die based off our core values that things began to change. And it was from this that I began to kind of start considering what could it be like to change how we operate and make everything that we do be about doing good and the byproduct of that being beneficial to our company. And so I don't know if I can pull this up on here now. So we stumbled onto this idea that we ended up finding out what B Corps are. B Corps have this idea that business can be used as a force for good. And we decided to kind of flip that topic around and present on this by actually going hard after something, going hard after something that we could adopt. And it was in 2007 that I had an encounter with one of my ancient friends, became a hero to me. His name is William Wilberforce. That name ring, ring, ring bell for any of you? So in 2007, I watched a movie that was produced about his life in 2006, and it was about his lifetime effort to bring an end to slavery in Great Britain in the 1800s. He goes 20 years at it and almost gives up, goes to his mentor, John Newton. John Newton, famous person, you probably know him better than you think you do. He's the one who wrote the song Amazing Grace. You think about that song, how powerful it is, and how many people that song touches now. And the words, I once was blind, and now I see, I once was lost, and now I'm found. He wrote those words, and he influenced Wilberforce to not give up, to fight to end slavery. And so after 20 years, instead of throwing the towel, he decided to press into it even more, and went another 20 years. And after 40 years of fighting up this cause, they passed the legislation in 1833, and the law was set, and then he dies two days later. He fought a ton of health issues his entire life. He, he had so many battles that he faced. And so in 2007, the seed was planted in me that 
look at this individual who gave everything of himself. He wasn't Christ, he wasn't Jesus, he wasn't a God-man, but he was a, a physical person who believed so passionately about something that he could pursue and he could make a difference with it. So that was kind of one of those first triggers. And then that would kind of stay underground for a while and uh, we got to the point where we started looking at what are we going to do to incorporate that into the business? What, what could our business have to do with something like this? And one of our clients was an ophthalmologist. And you may not know this, but blindness is a massive problem and it's not getting better. You actually will become blind in your life if you live long enough without correction, without cataract surgery. The, 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 the lens in your eye will eventually become opaque and cloudy and you'll have to have somebody come in and cut your eye open, take the lens out and put an artificial lens in. And one of our clients is an ophthalmologist and he has, asked us to go on an outreach uh, trip with him. And we got to go and, and find out that you can literally cure blindness within 10 minutes. A person can see 20-20 in many cases within 24 hours. And the cost to do it can be as little as $25. So if you're blind, what are you? You're a slave to darkness. You're a slave to being able to not have full ability, whether you're blind all the way or you have a vision impairment. And it was like, okay, we had this seed about living life fully like War Force did. Now we have this revelation about blindness and how easy it is. And then we go to the Global Leadership Summit where the, one of the executives of Walgreens talks about his journey presenting an idea to the leadership there, which was, let's do the one-for-one one campaign. We have people come and get a shot, and we'll give a shot to somebody else. And that idea was born out of what Tom Shoes decided to do, which was you buy a pair, and then you give a pair to someone else in need. And so we're sitting in the room, and we're thinking, well, we're a financial services company. We don't have vacation. We don't have immunizations. We don't sell products like shoes. Could we adopt something like this? Well, we now know that you can cure blindness for $25. Could we afford $25 per client engagement? Absolutely. And then it just took off. And so we decided we we're going to start doing this as a company. And we then had a mentor who encouraged us that, you know, what, what is your long-term goal for this going to be? because we started to reorient our business to say, we want our goals to be defined around the number of people's lives that we change as a byproduct of the work that we do. Yes, we wanna help our clients gain sight financially because our, our physician clients, they don't have financial background. So they live life like this, right? <laughs> they do. And so our job is we need to help them be able to see better. And so we do it every single day. And so while we help our clients gain sight financially, we're now in a position where we're giving sight globally through our nonprofit. And since we launched doing this, we've already helped over 3,000 people recover their sight. And we've established a big, uh, hairy audacious goal to essentially restore sight to as many people. And we're not able to do it alone. And so we decided to develop some technology for it. So you can actually pull up your phone right now, go to the app store, and you can download an app that simply by burning calories, you'll be able to cure blindness for somebody. The more calories you burn, the more people that are blind will gain vision. And so the way that we structured this was every time you burn 120 calories, that would raise a dollar. So we'll raise the money for you. We have, our company was the, was the initial contributor. We have other companies with us donating. And so every time you work out and you want you burn 3,000 calories, that's enough to restore sight to somebody because that's enough to raise $25. And so if you're not active health-wise now, this is a call to action for you. You get plugged in. If you are already doing that, don't let your calories that you're burning go to waste. Right? Put them to work. <laughs> you literally can change someone's life just by investing in you. And that's one of the things that Reed and I have really discovered that we're going to focus is that it all starts with your faith. Until you have faith, <clears throat> Until Jesus gives you vision, 
but you're blind. That's why the song says, I once was blind and now I say I once was lost. No, no, you are lost. I was lost until I got to John 3 and found that when Nicodemus was talking with Jesus, he was asking Jesus some questions. And Jesus says that you have to be born again. You have to be born of the Spirit. You cannot just be born once of the flesh. You have to be born of the Spirit. It's not through the family you come from. It's not through the church you go to. And it's not through, um, you know, good works and things like that. It's literally you have to respond and be born again. And so it all starts with faith. And once you get the, your faith figured out, now you have what we'll call a spiritual GPS. It allows you to see things that you couldn't see before. And that gives you the ability to now approach life differently. And you literally have the wisdom of God that can begin to start reorienting your life. And so it takes some serious effort and focus to focus on you and how to understand who you are, who God made you to be. And then from that, as you grow, you'll have more capacity to be able to give to others. And so that's what we launched uh, as a way for us to get the word out about this. And it's been amazing. We just got back from Trinidad and Tobago not too long ago. We've been to Tanzania. Uh, we've been to the Indian Reservation and Navajo Nation out there. And so we were doing all this work. And then I was at a, on a mystery trip with some CEOs. And what's a mystery trip? A mystery trip is where you say yes to going someplace. You don't know where you're going. You give them your passport. And they sign you up for everything. And you show up at the airport with a carry-on. That's it, one carry-on. And they tell you how to pack. And then you just go. And in this case, this one was to Costa Rica. And we're with the leaders of Firespring. You guys might know Firespring. And the founders, we were hanging out at the pool one day and they were talking to us about, hey, are you guys a D Corp? You know what a D Corp is? And I'm a, I'm a certified financial planner investment advisor and we work in the industry of LLCs and C Corps and S Corps and different formations because that's important to business. He's saying B Corp. I'm like, what in the world are you talking about? Like, There's no such thing as a B Corp. <laughs> right? that's all. And he begins to explain it to us and we're sharing what we care about, what our heart mission is. And it's like they say, uh, yeah, you're absolutely a B Corp. And so like, yeah, you can contact B Labs and they'll take you through a process where you can apply for the certified B Corporation uh, distinction. And it's a big undertaking. There's 200 questions that you have to go through. And I'm looking at everything like your, how do you treat your people? How do you make decisions? How do you impact the community? And all those factors. And so uh, you go through this rigorous process to get verified by a third party to see if you meet the criteria of being a socially and environmentally responsible organization. And so that was brand new. When did we get that read? Was that uh, last year? Yep. We just got it. Yep. It's like only a handful of these in Nebraska. And it's really the, the new way of business. The, the idea that business is just about the stakeholders, the shareholders about profit, when you think about where you are today, things that you care about, it's about much more than that today. And business is going to <coughs> continue on if it starts to shift in the direction and care about these things more. And so that's why we decided in a company, and part of the reason why we got the, B Corp, uh, the certified B Corp approval was because we have a mind, body, soul program in our company, which is where every time you work out, Every time you invest in your spiritual health, every time you invest in your mental health, you get paid. And so it works off like 10 minute intervals. You earn a dollar for every 10 minutes. And um, we have a, a process where you come and you say, here's what I'm gonna do. And then you come back in and say, here's what I did. And then there's evidence of that work that was done and then you get awarded for uh, that credit. And so. We found that as we invest in our people and help them become the best that they can be and understand and discover themselves, that they, they, they have a better experience. They're able to um, find more fulfillment, more, more joy, more value in what they're doing. And um, the whole environment in the office changes as a result of that culture. And so when I was in your shoes at this stage, I had no idea that 
we'd be in a, a situation where we're speaking all across the country now about stuff like this. And that we go from helping clients nationwide with our company to now we're changing people's lives on the, on the entire planet. And it's possible for you to do it too. And so this presentation, actually, I just gave one uh, two hour deal in Canada and we went through a workshop and actually explained how you can develop a plan like this for yourself. And so if this is something that resonates with you, come talk to us because we can help you figure out how to apply an idea where you go into adopting something like blindness and making it be the driver, the energy behind what you're doing. And you can apply that to your workplace or your, your self-employment or maybe the business that you want to start. And so uh, with that, maybe I'll um, I guess turn it over to you to take over. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Justin. Um, John, I, I'd never met Justin before today. So I was glad uh, to be able to have you to come and thank you for being willing to, to come. And I uh, look forward to developing a friendship with you more. Oh, yeah. Did you download yeah, the app. Yeah. And oh, you, yeah. Did you? Yeah. Slick Rick with the full suit on. Yeah. <laughs> what size are you? Uh, medium or large. Okay. It is a large size. It's like, well, download the app. Don't, make, don't let your calories go to waste. Oh, my God. Thank you, dude. Thanks. John, on the other hand, I've known for five or six years. Uh, we met a while ago. Uh, he's going to talk to you a little bit about the economy of communion. It's an organization that was started. Really, there's a there's a group called the Focolari in, the, in World War II in Germ in Italy. People were getting bombed. There was a young woman named Cher Lubitsch, and she saw that there are people around her that didn't have anything because their places got bombed. And so she said, "Let's start sharing with one another." So she and this group of, of young Christians got together and started sharing. They'd take down lists of things, then they'd get together the things that were needed. And they'd go and distribute them. And they just found there was always enough to share. And so they started this. They started reading the Bible together. And there, it became a worldwide movement, the Focolari, the worldwide movement. This, um, fast forward into 1991, she went to Brazil. She was visiting some Focolari there. And they found that there, she found that there's a lot of poverty um, in, in that area. And she said, well, how are, aren't these, these are your members. Why aren't you helping them? And they said, there's just too much poverty. We, we don't have enough to even share with them. She said, well, what else can we do? And what they came up with was what's called the economy of communion. And what it is, it's an idea of trying to create businesses so that people can actually be employed and make money instead of having charity. And so that was the whole idea of the economy of communion, is that you use private enterprise to help people to gain the dignity of working for their own money. And so that was the idea behind it. John started his company in 1995, just a few years later, uh, with his wife. Um, and now they've been doing that for the last... Uh, 20, 28 years. Uh, and so John has become a, a real head in the EOC. He's on the, the national board for the North America, but also internationally. He worked with the youth organization for EOC. So we're getting someone who doesn't just have a really cool company that does a lot of environmentally uh, conscientious stuff. With They did the largest cleanup in Brazil a few years ago for pollution. They do things worldwide. He's got a great company. He's also radically involved in economy and community. And he's a good person to come here and tell us about it. So thanks for being here, John. Great, thanks. Yeah, for, hey, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm going to give you like a two-minute video on this to give you a little perspective. That helps. So why don't we just go ahead and try running that if I can. Can you hear anything? Today we face a growing number of challenges around the world. Poverty and growing inequality are among the most pressing of these challenges, and whether directly or indirectly, affect us all. However, there are promising efforts underway to make a difference. The economy of communion is one of these efforts designed to create a positive and profound social transformation. We are a group of entrepreneurs and community leaders, of teachers and students, all of whom share a desire to build a more just, inclusive, and sustainable economy. The purpose of the economy of communion is to build bridges between those with resources and those in need. 
fostering mutual relationships founded on dignity and equality. We seek to nurture a culture of giving and community and believe that to be a successful company, it's not enough to generate income and redistribute wealth. For over 25 years, we have launched initiatives that generate a positive social impact. Through entrepreneurial activities and education, we have increased the possibilities of job generation and income for those with economic challenges, strengthened individuals' commitment to civic engagement, and pooled and shared financial resources, time, and expertise to directly address social and economic conditions of vulnerability around the world. How do we do this? We have an international network of over 800 companies in more than 50 countries that share their business experience and resources. We have business centers that support and house participating ventures. Our international business incubator network supports the development of new businesses in more than 13 countries through entrepreneurial training. We have an international internship program that provides hands-on experience for young people interested in learning how to run an EOC company. We hold workshops on entrepreneurship and business culture, which prepare young people to pursue their dreams. Want to be part of the economy of communion? We need people who believe in their ability to make a difference in the world. Join our Economy of Communion Association. Participate in our workshops. Become an investor and more. Your investment will contribute directly to reducing the negative impacts of poverty around the world while creating new opportunities for those who need it most. So there was a lot that I absorbed there that was put together by some interns last summer, uh, one of the projects to, to try to describe to work regular people what this thing is, what is the economy of communion. Uh, you know, I started out as a as a head of technology in a large environmental company that I helped create over 25 years ago. And it was all founded on great American capitalist model of, you know, making lots of money, profits, uh, everybody motivated by monetary kind of things. And, you know, I wasn't really happy with that because I had this desire to kind of merge my personal belief system with, uh, with what I do during work. So when we heard about this Kiara Lubick who came to Brazil in 1991 uh, and we saw what was happening down there, my wife Julie and I were like, hey, this could be something significant. I mean, this could be a game changer. If we were able to create businesses that shared profits and distributed them and helped the poor, uh, and we knew that that kind of experience could be pretty amazing. And I won't say we joined right away because it took a little Bit of effort, but we, we went on and finally decided, you know, this vision of trying to create uh, a more fraternal economy where we cared about each other uh, was really attractive to us. So, um, so we decided to join and uh, Kiara Lubick, who was still alive at that time, gave us an operating motto, there's more joy in giving than receiving. And that kind of gave us kind of a, you know, a direction like, okay, we understand this could be, it was a little scary because I had four kids, none of them had gone to college. What do you, what do you mean, giving away the profits? You, how, is that, am I gonna have someone looking over my shoulder, taking money out of my company? And it wasn't anything like that at all. It's all in total freedom. So, uh, so, so what is the economy of communion? Sorry, I might have to just push the button. Yeah, I'll just do this, right? So really the idea about the economy of community is really to promote, the whole idea is to promote this uh, global uh, culture of giving and social justice through businesses, animated through you know, these values of fraternity. Uh, and that really the, 
uh, the vision really is about to build a more just and humane economy where you know everyone where we're really receiving and giving are seen as equal partners it's not like oh the, the, the giver the companies are these great kind of entities and the receivers are oh, the poor destitute people no it's really this kind of dynamic that happens and uh so really what we find out really when we get down to it is it's really creating this atmosphere where relationships are key in business. And anybody who runs a business can say, well, relationships are good in any business, right? Yeah, well, they are. But the kind of relationships we really try to think about aren't only with your clients who pay the bills or your vendors who supply you, it's with a host of people, including the community in which you operate the, the geographic community. It's about with, with those in need in that same geographic community, but it's also about other people uh, uh, who want to become involved in this. It's not, it, even though it's driven by business, it's also it's supported through a network of young people and, and academics. So, uh, so that was pretty cool. So this was all new 25 years ago. I mean, it was like, okay, how do we do this? This hasn't been done before. Kiara gave us this vision, but you know, what do you do every day, you know? So really, it really began where, you know, we started, I'd gone from a company to help build a 2,900 people to a company of one, me. So it's, it's really easy to be loving to yourself, right? There's only you every day, you know. But um, the idea, though, is that I had to start with myself first. I had to begin working on myself, and I had to decide, did I want to adopt this uh, this lifestyle of communion is my driving force in business, where everything, even though it was important to make money, have profits to grow, it is just as important to, to focus on these relationships in an intense way. So uh, that was, I mean, that was the first thing, working on yourself, um, really trying to also live this integrated life we talked about of, of marrying your values to also uh, what you do every day. So, so what, what is that, what do you do when you do that? I mean, what does that day look like? Well, you know, if you're, what I often say is if you, uh, you have to start looking at people differently. Uh, we know that when, you know, each person in a company has value and purpose, but you have to treat people no matter what they're, what they're, what they do every day, what their station in the company equally. And kind of like this, you say, how, how would God look at people? I mean, God look at people the same, if it, no matter if it's the FedEx man or your housekeeper cleaning your office or the VP of, a, of your client, you know, they, they all have equal value. And uh, you, have, you don't get a pick anymore who you like and who you don't like, which is really something, you know, like speaking of a triathlete, it's kind of a loving triathlete. You have to begin practicing this because it doesn't come easy because, you know, naturally I look at someone and I go, I don't like that guy. I'm not going to give him a shot. You know, or this employee, this employee really bothers me. He's, he or she's not doing her job, you know. So you have to begin training yourself to really kind of adopt that inside that kind of loving attitude like, hey, this is the person that's put before me in this moment. And my life's meaning is derived from those relationships. So it, it, everyone's important. So, so it really encourages loving people. It encourages loving concretely. Everyone you come in contact with, these are some of the values. You know, first to help others. Uh, value every person, every idea. Uh, support with actions, not words, you know. It's great to say, hey, can I help you? It's another thing to, like, help you, you know. Um, Build relationships every day. Share expertise, time yourself. I often say in that one, time is so important in business, you know? We, we have very little of it so that when you actually stop and share your time and yourself, it's, it's an amazing thing in business. And clients feel that as well as your employees, as well as uh, community people. So and I like this last one. We often talk about competitors can be friends too. What the heck is that? I mean, <laughs> Aren't we supposed to drive competitors into the ground? Isn't that what made America great? <laughs> uh, no, it's, it's, a, it's an idea that there, there are things to be learned from competitors and relationships to be built that, that I can tell you some 
we have time, I'll tell you a few things like that. So this idea, so my wife and I kind of jumped into this and we began growing the company, adding a person a year. We began the company downtown Indianapolis in a really run down area. I'd come out every night and I'd step over homeless people in the building we were in. Across the street were prisoners coming out or people coming out of prison that were just released. My car was broken into, blah, blah, blah. The idea is that we don't kind of separate, it would have been easy to stay out of that area, but it's really this idea of kind of being with the company right there and making a difference. And I can tell you, I did like poor people sometimes. I don't like people going to the bathroom on my steps. I sometimes <laughs> walked across the street to avoid them. And yet these were the people I was supposed to be helping with my company. So it, again, it was this training, kind of this training you had to go through to say, no, I'm going toward that person. I'm finding out who they are. I'm uh, seeing what we can do to help, you know, instead of avoiding someone or giving them money, hey, let's go eat at Subway together, you know, whoa. You mean you're going to give this person time now? You know, so a lot of uh, uh, conversion happened. So, uh, so yeah, so we started one place and then we moved to another place on the other side of the city. Same thing, people needing um, a lot of help, rundown area, a soup kitchen across the street from a place at a church every week. And what I really want to emphasize as part of this is that this economy of community is really about, when you talk about a united world and helping people all across the planet and locally, we really see ourselves as weavers of community, as the business is an active part of that kind of activity locally. And that starts with small things like employees seeing that you give them time to work on social projects in the community. or or that you decide to adopt uh, protocols that say, we're not gonna buy anything that's not given, uh, uh, made in the neighborhood, or we're not gonna use any supporting contractor that doesn't live within five miles. You know, even if it's more expensive. All your finance people back there are going, what? <laughs> Minimize cost, you know? So, so this idea of becoming a, Community support weaver, a uh, another one. That's our that's our community. Uh, this idea of really being integrated into your community, even if those people don't buy your products or services, is part of this. It's part of this uh, network that we form. So you can see Mundell. I've got various. Uh, we have a we have a location for our buildings right over here. We ended up buying a couple of other buildings to house some of our uh, interns that we have every year from different countries to talk about the economy of community. Every time a new restaurant opens up, all of our employees are giving free passes to eat at the, the, the businesses. So we they feel like they're part of you know who we are. So a lot of energy, and, and I would say this, when you start looking at yourself geographically and saying, what kind of relationships do we have? It's really an examination of conscience sometimes. It's like, wow, we're avoiding this part. What's going on? So, uh, so yeah, this is all about the part of, of building these kind of relationships community-wide. Every Thursday, we have relationships with this uh, church where we go and we work at food pantries. Some of the employees volunteer at different times if they can help. Others have, uh, uh, there are schools on this map here and here where we've gone and taught young people about environmental scientists, science because we're environmental people. And that's what we do. We're geology or hold Earth Day celebrations for them. So depending on the kind of business, the EOC business you have, you focus on different we focus on different things, right? We're environmental consultants, so we focus on the earth and, and uh, what I have. Obviously, here's one example of bringing kids over to teach them what we do. How do you take samples? Uh, what kind of education do you need for, for becoming kind of this, uh, this kind of scientist or engineer? Uh, also helping clean up houses that are destitute. You know, we have had several company days where we go on as a company and, and do what Andy does for his people a lot less effective because we don't know what we're doing, but helping rehab houses or cleaning up contamination. Uh, this is a group that worked on 
a school project. It was building a particular slide on building a rain garden to help take the water from a school building and treat it before it went and discharged into a river. So, so I think uh, what I want to do is I want to give you an example because <clears throat> we don't have that much time. A kind of an example of an experience that we had where one of our interns, two interns, one from Colombia, one from Brazil, came and learned about the economy of communion one summer. And they thought, okay, we need to practice this with the community. Well, let's go get a cup of coffee. You know, this is like, so they went to, uh, let's go back. They went to, yeah. They went to a, a coffee house down the street and they walked in to the, to the shop and there's a long line and they're waiting there and they're seeing someone hush, hustling around serving clients and things are not going well. I mean, something was amiss, you know? So they got up closer and closer. Finally, they were up the front and uh, they kind of tried, they thought, okay, we need to develop relationships, right? We're learning about this internship. How, so we, they started asking her, how's, how's it going today? She goes, how's it going? It is terrible. My supplier didn't show up. I had some arguments with a member of the family and to top it all off, today's my birthday. And they go, wow. So they really were trying to talk to her and you know, have a little dialogue. And so they went out with a coffee and they said, you know, we need to do something. This is the economy of communion. This is, what can we do to help the situation? And they thought, oh, we'll go across the street and we'll buy her a birthday present. So they walked across the street, got a present, got back in line. The line was not very long at that point. They got up again. and. They got the front. She goes, what are you guys doing here again? And they smiled at each other and they reached back behind and said, happy birthday. And the lady looked at them. This is for me? This is for my birthday? And then she started to cry. And I always get choked up when I think about this because it's such a lesson. Well, that's not the end of the story, though. Uh, they, they left, had a nice exchange left. Two weeks later, a bunch of our employees went to the same coffee house, came in, and it was a nice day. She's working. Hey, where are you guys, where are you guys from? Oh, we work at Mandel and Associates. Mandel and Associates. You have the best employees in the whole world. <laughs> All the employees left that day with free coffee. And I think... You know, we don't have much time, but I think this is one small example of what we try to live in this style of business, where the business comes into a community, starts trying to uh, help it, transform it, offer whatever it can, and reciprocally, the, the, the community does the same thing to the business. And I often think what an amazing world this would be if we were able to inject this divine enzyme into every business, what the world could be like. That's a little bit of what the economy of community is about. Thank you. This is the app that is about to restore sight to a million people around the world. This is Justin. This is Reed. It all began when these business partners learned two very important things. 200 million people in the world have a visual impairment. But with access to basic vision care, 80% of world blindness is avoidable. Together, these two business partners created the nonprofit Give Sight Global. Justin and Reed set the goal to give 1 million people their vision back by 2028 by providing glasses and surgery to communities in need. But to meet their goal, they need people who are willing to break a sweat to help out. That's where the app comes in. Yep, this app. To become a part of the effort, download the GiveSight Global app to your phone. Sync it with the fitness app of your choice and work out. Our corporate donors will match $1 for every 120 calories you burn. Watch as your calories and match donations rack up. When you reach $25, You've raised enough to reverse blindness for a person in need. $25. That's the average cost to restore someone's sight with glasses or corrective surgery. 
With the Money Your Workouts raise, Give Psych Global can fund the efforts of volunteer physicians and eye technicians who travel to areas that don't have regular access to eye care. People are already working out with the app and sharing their accomplishments with the world. You can join a team with your workplace or organization and start curing blindness together. The more you work out, the more people have access to life-changing vision care. Join Justin and Reed and their goal to help one million people see again. Download the GiveSight app and make every workout into a sight-restoring experience. You move, we raise, and together, we can change the way millions of people see the world. started out, you know, we would gather resumes to, um, to uh, interview people with, and we saw a lot of people that we couldn't hire, but they were good people. We thought, what should we do with this? Now, the old days, an old company, I would take those resumes, throw them in the trash can, and move on, you know, but with this idea of the economy of meeting, we thought, well, let's, why don't we take those resumes and send them to our competitors, because these are people needing jobs, and and maybe they need them. So we, we, we did that. That was one of the things we did. And sure enough, a lot of our competitors hired some of the people that we sent to them. Sometimes, unfortunately for us, because they were good people, but no. But, but they were really struck by this kind of act of generosity. And uh, so we would uh, do things uh, like that. Uh, some people were trying to start competitive businesses and wanted to know how to start a business. I eat with them for lunch and I would tell them everything that I did wrong in starting my business. And they appreciated that. And, uh, and uh, you know, people will always try to get you to talk badly about your competitors. Hey, they're pretty bad. Well, aren't they bad? You know, it's real easy from a human standpoint. You're kind of going, even if you know they're not as good as you, to not say anything. But we made a lot of efforts to never, it became company policy to never speak badly of competitors. Well, a couple things happened. One time I got a call out of the blue, I answered my cell phone, yeah, hey John, this is Steve from, from Acuity. Hey Steve, what's going on? There's a competitor. Hey, I'm sitting in here in my conference room with about 10 people and we were faced with a difficult employee situation. And we don't know what to do. And one of the people said, I wonder what John Mandel would do. <laughs> and they called me. And I go, wow. Okay, so so they call and uh, they they outline the, the problem and uh, and then they said, what do you think? I thought, I thought, well, here's what I would do. You know, if it were me, it's a difficult employee situation, but you, you, know, you got to give them a chance. And I brought, outlined a lot of steps that were, I thought, the way we were trying to handle. It. When I was done, there was like this dead silence. And I thought I they'd hung up, you know, or something. <laughs> but I said, hey, Steve, are you guys there? And he goes. Oh no, we're we're here. We're all shaking our heads up and down, and uh, I think we have the right direction now. Really appreciate it. Thanks. That was one time. I had another time where um, I had a president of another environmental company, a woman. I'm not saying it's this a woman and why she was doing this, but she called me up crying. I go, "What's wrong, Deb?" And she goes, "You know, I didn't know who else to call, and I thought you would be the only one to understand. I just had an employee turn in the resignation. It really." hurts. And I just was wondering what you, I wanted to share that and wondering if you've ever had that kind of feeling. I said, oh my gosh, yeah. I mean, it really, when you get attached to people and you get to know them and then they have to leave. I said, I felt the same way. So we, you know, we had this really beautiful conversation and then she, she hung up. So that, that's another example. Probably the most dramatic example of loving your competitors we've had is we were uh, going after work in another state and we were down to like the final two, and we showed up, and uh, the city, we were working for a city, and the city, the city's lawyer had to go through the checklist of, they called all of our references, and, and you know, went through all of our stuff, 
and he said, you know, I think I, we would like, I would like to recommend this company, Mandel and Associates. And the town council, this is a count, town council with people in the audience. They said, why is that? Well, their, their references checked out wonderfully. I mean, the people who work with them love them, but that's not why I'm recommending it. So why, why not? He said, well, I'm recommending it that we hire them because I called their competitors because I was trying to get any dirt I could on this company. And the competitors down to everyone said, you would do well to hire this company. Wow. So, you know, I've had those, I have a, I have a lot more, but those are the kind of things that make you realize if, if you're able to have relationships with competitors, you ought to be able to have relationships with clients. <laughs> you know, you can hit that mark. So anyway, that's a little Other questions? You could probably do a, a full day symposium, so I guess maybe the top thing that comes to mind for either of you guys. When you consider actually implementing this into either an existing business in your case or a new business in your case, and making it not this nice thing that we do um, because we want to do it, but actually making it a almost a mission critical part of the business. Uh, so that way it's, um, I think you had said, we, we realized that our business is going to live and die based off of our core values. So how you begin integrating that when you know that team members have those values, but making it actually like one and the same with business development and not just the side. <laughs> Can you repeat that question just for the microphone? I'm not sure what the question is. I think the question is, how do you get everyone on board to make this so critical uh, right. a component? Right, so I'm, I'm a financial advisor as well. So me and my partner both, we're, we're mission oriented and we, we have a heart for the community and different organizations and there's ideas and we are philanthropic in our own right, but yeah. actually making that part of the DNA of the practice. Right. Uh, just anything that comes to mind when you think about that for integrating with your business. Yeah, so when I was speaking in Canada, we did a whole workshop on how to build a plan for you. And so this would be like the super abbreviated version of it. Answer this question. How do you apply something that you're passionate about, or that you care about? And what we talked about was define a goal. If you can have something like a 10 year goal that you want to achieve in the business, that's measurable. And then you think about what are you already giving to, what do you care about, uh, what's that passion, that purpose that you are engaged in the community, and then break down into a metric units. How much could we, how much money would it take in units to impact that thing that I care about? So we had somebody said, well, I'm, I'm involved in Habitat for Humanity. And we're not gonna be building houses every time we get a new client, our clients are not, <laughs> we don't have that much revenue for client. And it was like, well, that probably won't work, but what if you were to say every time you work with somebody, you install a new window? Maybe the window is the part of the house that you want to say, we'll install this as a result of that. So if you can take that passion, that purpose that you have, and find it in digestible units, then run those units through on a per revenue unit basis and make sure that they're a, a number that is not too big, or then you can well, and then define a way to integrate that into your sales process. So that way, every time you talk to somebody, they hear that, hey, as a part of this thing, like you're super excited about this. This is going to change. Like, I'm, I'm coaching somebody right now. And her thing is kind of similar to what you're involved with, where she helps companies get launched off the ground internationally. It's a microfinancing type of company. So every time that she takes on a client, she is already giving to this organization. And so now a new business will start every time she engages with a new customer. And so she's not only helping people with growing their businesses, but while she while they do that together, somebody else is gonna get a chance to have their own company at the same time because they can do it in such small denominations. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that's great. Okay. You know, one of the things we do We've done a lot of things, but you know, we found that it's always like you 
He said, find something very direct that you can touch, that it's passionate, you can measure it. We have an international internship program we've had for about uh, 14, 15 years. And every year we brought young people from around the world to the United States for two to six months as an intern to understand how do you run an EOC socially responsible business? And what does that mean? What, how do you get involved in the community? Ideas on starting your own business when you go back home. So with 70 interns over that time period and our employees every year exposed to people from around the world who have this interest, getting to know them and parties and small things, they, they for us, our employees were educated by the interns even more so than me because it's not like the boss telling them, hey, we're gonna help the poor, here's a check for the, we're gonna help, you know, some, something, this is real people they met that end up going back to, uh, to their home country, stay in contact with me, but also with my employees. Some of the employees have visited interns when they've gone over to Italy or to Brazil or whatever. So, so I think for us, it's, I mean, the first step really for me is always to try to live it. Like this man here, where people say, he, he walks with the walk, talks and talk. And, and that people can feel free to adopt that. Hey, I, I think this is a good mission. I want to live this too. This is part of our DNA. Also involved them in various community events. And so there are a lot of ways, but it's all, not, in, not anyone get 100%, not everybody. I, I didn't, I tell everybody when we hire them, hey, we're part of this thing and here's what we do. Some people want to come because this is what we do. Uh, others, yeah, I'm a scientist. I want to help the earth clean up the earth. So, so you gotta sometimes understand when it's The nice thing is you can pick something and be wrong, and it's okay. As soon as you figure out that it's wrong, it's like better, you can shift and pivot to that thing. So that's what I feel like is freeing, even like finishing from high school or, or undergrad or the first phase, like it's okay to be wrong. It's a process of figuring out where you focus. And uh, little by little, you start to get that more and more clear so the first thing that you select may not be the right one. That's okay. It won't last forever. You can shift to something else. Good question. Thanks, Trevor. One quick question. Come on back there. Let's hear a question from the last three rows. Come on. We'll give you. I'll give you a dollar for this. <laughs> All right, you guys out. What are some of the biggest barriers you guys have seen uh, when you're trying to get other companies to take this same approach of being mindful and how they interact with uh, the community? What what things hold people back? Is it more like physical barriers or just kind of a mindset? For, for me, I've you know part of my job in the international level is to try to encourage young people all over the world to take this on. So I we help we hold schools and workshops week week long, two days here, three days there. And uh, I found that the, the biggest barriers are in here in the United States because there's more to lose when you decide to, to take this attitude, you know? I mean, if I give up my high paying job to do this, I want, I'm gonna give up something. Whereas, you know, we started probably 35 to 40 companies in Africa and they have nothing. So why, is, why isn't this something you do? This is beautiful, you know? So it's one of the barriers is, is uh, is this idea you're giving up something, the uncertainty financially, how can you do this? You know, are you really, am I gonna have a good financial life if I just also become a saint? And start giving away <laughs> my profits, you know? And so that, I, I find that's a difficult thing. And I, I, I often tell the stories of, I had that same concern. I had four kids going in from high school and grade school before we, when I started this, and I thought, how are we gonna pay for college, you know? To give an example, I had a son, my oldest son, smart kid, 800 SAT, got accepted to MIT. MIT didn't care if I gave away $100,000, it's how much the company's revenue is. So there was no money for MIT. Oh, that hurt, I'm a Purdue engineer, my son gets accepted to MIT. What's gonna happen? Well, my, my, my son understood what our mission was in the family. We could take, instead of giving the MIT tuition every year, we were giving it away. And he said, that is okay, I, I'm, I'm going to Purdue. I got a full ride to Purdue University. If I want to go to MIT at all, in grad school, I'll do that. So that was the hardest thing. I mean, that, that's a real practical thing. There are sacrifices you make. 
We also find that the more you give, the more you receive. So I've had so much stuff, we call it providence. Providence strikes again uh, in the sense that unexpected good things, people giving you things, people doing things for you, people giving you uh, vacation times in Brazil because they love you. I mean, good, good will and relationships uh, are something unbelievable. So I try to convince people of that. But you still have those. Do you remember what the arc reactor is? Mm -hmm. The arc reactor? You seen the Iron Man movies? <laughs> no? <laughs> okay. Well, Tony Stark was taken hostage in a cave and he had to find a way to get out of the cave. Well, they had to have some kind of device to keep the palladium or the, 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 uh, the, the shrapnel from getting into his heart or his lungs. And so he built this unit that was like a power source. And then when he gets back home, he creates a new element that he, he actually has his own laboratory that can build it. And so I think the, the answer to this question is people think that they're concerned about, you know, how giving what you're going to receive. Our experience has been when you press in a stuff like this, it creates an energy force that has its it's a, it's a whole animal on its own. It takes off for you. And so I didn't go through all the slides. Um, I think this would make sense for the time that we had. But in our business, we wanted to be in the press. We wanted to get attention. We wanted to get uh, recognition and things like that. And yes, we're nationwide. Yes, we have clients in all 50 states. Yes, we have about 6,000 clients. And we've done a lot of great things. But that's really not that attractive to press. Well, since we started to pursue this as our goal, being able to change lives through vision, financial vision first and now physical vision second, what's happened is we're getting all kinds of press. We're speaking all kinds of places. We're in all kinds of articles now. I mean, we're getting so much attention now that we never could have created on our own. And simply by saying, we're gonna go after this thing. What if we could go after one thing that by simply doing that, it could, be like a magnet, it could attract so much. Not because we just want it for business, because we actually care, we give a rip about this thing. And so I think it's hard for people to grasp the potential of this. And so being able to imagine a possible future is the first step of it. And the whole process we talk about that you go through to get to this point. But making that shift, as you kind of alluded to mentally, is a, a difficult thing to see the possibilities of it. But it has turned on so much more avenues for us is that it's attracting people to us now much more than us having to be going out as a business. I'll add one thing to that because it reminded me of something that happened to us. Uh, so for many years the economy of community was under the radar, right? I would talk to friends, hey what are you doing? Well I've served this company, we're part of this thing called the economy of community. What's that? Well it was started by this lady, Carol Ludwig from Pokemon, what's that? You know? So, so for like 14 years, we operated with, with no press, nothing, knowing what to do. And then one time, something amazing happened. The amazing thing was that uh, a few years back, a uh, pope by the name of Pope Benedict XVI decided to write an encyclical called Caritas Veritate and mention the economy of community by name in the encyclical. But we knew this before an encyclical was published, it sent around the world to certain people. And a lot of people received this and didn't know what he was even talking about. I said, what is this thing? And within like three days, I had, I had emails and faxes from all over the world because they Googled the economy of communion in North America and just wanted to see it would pop up. And for some reason, my company got picked up and, oh my gosh. And, and so there's this guy. His name's John Allen. He's a famous journalist from the National Catholic Reporter and different things. He calls up, interviews me, and all that. And so he issues this, this article in the paper that says, uh, Pope, Pope endorses small Indiana environmental consulting firm. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I call him up after why did you do this? This makes it look like the Pope personally, like, 
endorsed our company. He goes, no, I thought this would catch attention. I go, well, as soon as he asked, that's a lot. <laughs> so, so we had the people who knew me in the Soko Art Movement called up, did the Pope know me? <laughs> no, he did not endorse. I mean, he didn't endorse in a generic thing. But what I'm saying is, sometimes you get, you don't know where it's coming from, you know? And, and we had, luckily, a couple years ago, Pope Francis did the same thing and said things and maybe those steps were good. You never know. It's the good thing. You, you, I've learned that you have to just go out. Just, just you have to follow that passion and that that uh, purpose, and the good things happen. Well, thank you, fellas. I think we'll go ahead and get started with our third speaker of the day. Um, Mark probably came. He probably lived the closest, or he was the closest to come here today. We had John who came all the way from Indiana. Indiana, but Mark's just up the street on 24th Street. He works as a COO at Heart Ministries. Uh, he will probably share his story of how he first started getting there. He was there as a volunteer for a while, then started working, and now he's a COO. Has a lot of background in finance. He was actually vice president of a bank for a while, and uh, God really turned him around and made him brought him to the place where he's at now, where he's using his uh, expertise to really grow heart ministry. I'm sure he'll share a little bit about that. It's an exciting thing that he's done there. Mark, we appreciate you being here. And it's been good to just get to know you a little bit. You're a unique individual and a very authentic individual. I appreciate that about you. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Mark Dare, and I'm really grateful to be here. I'm going to tell you guys the truth of my experience. That's, that's really all I have. I'm not going to tell you about anything I read in a book. I'm going to tell you about what happened to me and what I'm doing in my life today. So I'm going to tell you about two chapters of my life and then the first chapter, something that was supposed to happen that never happened. And then in the second chapter, something that was never supposed to happen that happened. I'm going to center it around business, faith, and the common good. And I'm going to give you guys some takeaways that are relevant to me being the man I am today that I learned during those different stages. <clears throat> Lessons hard learned are not easily forgotten, right? Lessons hard learned are not easily forgotten. My biggest growth in life has come from my biggest failures. What does it mean to fail? It means to come up short. And I was never good at asking for help. So whether it's personally or professionally, young people, old people too, I encourage you to ask for help if you need it, right? 14 times in the Stations of the Cross, there's 14 of them, and three of them, that Jesus guy has fallen down. And what's he do every time? Gets back up. And in two of the three, what's happening? Someone's helping him, right? Someone's helping him. So if the Son of Man needed some help, surely we're going to need some help along the way. So when and if you need help, don't be afraid to ask for help, right? And then whatever you're doing, whether it's business, whether it's your academics, do it well. You do it really, really, really well. And why do you do it really well? You do it well because you can, right? And if you do something well, through the natural course of things, you'll wind up exactly where you're supposed to be in whatever system you are in. And by a system, and systems I've been in, it can be a mod in a prison, it can be my family system, it can be Creighton's system. It can be where you work. It's a different place with different people and a different set of rules. And the common denominator in every system is you're going to be there. And hopefully you will bring that God person with you. So I'm the youngest of three boys. My, child, my father is an only child, Lebanese male, five generations, all males. And my brothers and I did not get a lot of sensitivity training. <laughs> We were all taught to be very good businessmen, though. Everything in our family was always business. It's business. When there was adversity, we kept it in the family, and we were raised to do what it takes to get the job done. And if God is for you, who can be against? Right? If God is for you, who can be against? So business, everything was business. You're negotiating. You're working with people to work towards a resolution that is acceptable to both parties involved. 
So even though I didn't know it, I was always modeling my father, who over time, I guess you could say, became kind of my God, which wasn't a good thing. That's another thing. Whatever you think about the most, I believe in your higher power. So what do you all think about the most? And if it's not God's will, then you might want to reevaluate that. Life is short. None of us is getting out of this thing alive. God gave you this life and he has a plan for you. What are you doing with the gifts that he gave you? So my father, I remember him, who's an accountant by trade, good accountant, worked for one of the big fours, did a great job, didn't like some of the politics going on in the big fours, so he started working at Omaha National Bank, which used to be in the Woodman Tower, eventually at the top office at the Woodman Tower, but I'll get to that. I remember my dad getting ready, be putting on his tie, and he'd be asking me, math problem, math problem, math problem, what's this, what's this, what's this? Real quick, like my mind was always good when it came to math, numbers, figuring stuff out. I would answer those problems and occasionally get one wrong. My dad, if he got it wrong, it was okay, but he kind of looked at you like, come on, you know, you could have done a little better than that. OCD, perfectionistic, just like his son. But I loved having that time with my dad. And I'm grateful that today I have more time with my daughter than he had with me. He needed to go make something for the family. He didn't have much growing up. And he believed that. Providing for us was the best way that he could show us his love. So I would love that time with him, and I would love being able to get those answers right. And I crave that time with him. So over time, I always did well in school. Um, I went to Creighton Prep, all boys Jesuit school. My brothers went there. My dad went there. My dad's dad went there. Those Ignatian values, praise, service, reverence of God. How do we invite God into every aspect of our lives? Have a relationship to talk, and to listen, to pray, and to meditate. And that's something I didn't know anything about back then. I was self-conscious. I was insecure. I wanted to be cool. I wanted to be popular. I wanted to be the toughest guy. I wanted the best-looking girl. And we also talked about being men for others, right? That was our motto. Men or women for others. It's all boys. But what's it mean to be a man for others? What's it mean to be a woman for others? I believe it is in being a part of with someone else that I disappear. Me, that flawed human nature that is egotistical, self-centered, and insecure fades away, and I become a part of something that is true, something that is real, a human connection. I also believe that a friend in need is a friend indeed. I always believed that. I did not like it when people were picked on. I did not like it when the little guy did not have a voice. That is just something that God gave me. So I wound up going to Miami of Ohio. I had a 4-0. I tested well. It was a top 10 finance school in the country. It was then that I, I remember I smoked weed for the first time, right? My mom's brother had died of a drug overdose, so my brothers and I were raised no drugs. So in the Dare family, we did not do drugs, and drugs were a no-no. I drank. I binge drank. The guys I played sports with, we drink. We drink a lot. Young people, I think Warren Buffett said this, habits, habits too light to feel until too hard to carry. Habits too light to feel until too hard to carry. If you're dabbling with a little something, maybe you shouldn't dabble with. If you're wired like me, be careful, because one day it might be too hard to carry. And that was my experience over time. I failed miserably at Miami, Ohio. I was non-academically suspended. With two weeks left my freshman year, I was boxing, I was bouncing, I was partying. I was the man, I guess you could say. It felt good not to be a part of my family where everything was business. It felt good to go out and be myself. At least I thought I was trying to figure out who I was. Two things I've learned that I've utilized today that are probably the most important thing about me being an effective father and businessman, because remember, everything is business. It is responsibility and humility responsibility and humility. Humility is a modest or low view of one's own importance. I was raised to be important. I was Mike Dare's son. Mike Dare eventually owned a bank. It's on the top floor of the Woodman Tower. And I was always taught, you're a dare. Too much is given, much is expected. Go compete, go win, go do what it takes to get the job done. And then responsibility. It is hard to be responsible when you are not humble. 
And responsibility is the opportunity or ability to act independently and make decisions without authorization. Your teachers are not always gonna be here. Your parents might not already be here. And me, I never knew what to do. What do I do, what do I do? I always had this energy inside, but I never knew what to do with it. Today, I let go, I let God, and I do the next right thing. Action, 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 action. It's been my experience. You can act your way into a different way of thinking, but it's very hard to think your way into a different way of acting. So when in doubt, act. Faith without works is dead. Faith without works is dead. So I always believed, and I was a big believer, and I thought God favored me. You know, that grace thing. When I should have lost, I won. Things went well for me. I didn't study, I didn't prepare, but I did 100%. I was decent looking, I was intelligent, I was pretty strong, I had good hand-eye coordination, and you could put me in a predicament normally I'd put myself in, but I could always pull up. I could always pull, pull up. So if you're the type of person who likes to cram, who can read stuff and kind of memorize it, um, procrastinates, maybe consider not needing to do things through that pattern and maybe be ahead of the curve. Don't put yourself in a situation where you need to do this. I want to transfer into University of Arizona in Tucson. They had a psych law program that was attractive to me. Through my actions and my increased drinking and drug use, I was getting exposure to the law. So I thought maybe I should get to know something about it. And then psychology. I wasn't raised to deal with my feelings. I had a girl who was my high school sweetheart. I broke up with her my freshman year in college. And I did not know how to deal with that feeling, my emotions, psychology. What are these feelings things? It's business. Everything's business. How are feelings involved in business? It's the bottom line. It's being profitable. It's a return to your stakeholders, your shareholders. It's going out in the marketplace, attacking that marketplace, and winning. Having a product that your customers need or want, doing it better than the other guy. You got to be the lowest cost or a differentiator. I was always taught to be a differentiator and customer service, right? You treat the customer well. And if I'm treating the customer well and I got a good reputation and I'm good at business, that's in the interest of the common good, right? I'm good at business. I'm helping everyone else out. Now, I was a teller when I was a senior in high school. My brothers and I all were, I think a junior as well. And when I would come back in the summers, I would also work at the bank. So eventually college wasn't something that I was ready for. I think I was 23, 24 years old. And dad said, you don't deserve it, but I'm gonna give you a chance to work at the bank, right? My brothers worked there. They're three years, four years older than me, 10, 10 months apart. And one of us was gonna take over at the bank. My dad had left Omaha National. He had purchased the bank along with some other people. And that's what my brothers and I were gonna do. At least one of us, because dares were bankers. So another thing, if you're in a business, it's been my experience and it's benefited me in both places, know it from the ground up, right? I was a teller, I oversaw the tellers, I worked in new accounts, I worked in customer service, I was an assistant branch manager, I was a branch manager, I oversaw the wire desk, I did loans, I was a loan officer, and then I was a vice president. So I knew the bank from the ground up and that value it gave me for my customers was great because I knew when they came into the bank, which is something that they could have done anywhere because we pretty much had the same stuff, right? It's a fungible product. The difference was me. I could get what they wanted, when they, when they wanted it, how they wanted it. If it was important to them, it was important to me. That's another thing in business. Know your customers and if it's important to them, make sure it is important to you. So as a lender, I was really good, right? I had a decent emotional IQ. I'm good at reading people. Remember, it was always business. We were learning, we were, we were taught to negotiate. You were negotiating at the dinner table about eating your liver and onions or not, right? With that, and that was always a losing negotiation, which is why I went to the bathroom and spit that out in the toilet and came back or would drink some milk to take it down. But we were always negotiating. And that's a very valuable skill set. Like I told you with accounting, accounting is a very valuable skill set. I banked a lot of businesses. Someone with an accounting background 
It was always beneficial to the way they did business, having that analytical mind. So as a vice president, I developed the most business. My fee income was the highest. My loans were the highest. My deposits were the highest. I got to sit at so many tables with so many different people and learn what made a good manager, the who part, and then what businesses succeeded or failed. You know, bars, restaurants, retail, highest mortality rate of any other business, billboards, storage facilities, highest profit margin of any other business. Tombstones, tombstones, baked goods, highest profit margin actually, highest rate of return on your money will be billboards, storage facilities, right? The amount of money you make on those through your lease income, rental income, versus what you need to pay off, that what you need to pay off will be done quickly and you will own that asset free and clear and have a ton of cash flow. My brother did the billboard business in Chicago, built and sold two billboard companies, killed it. Splits time in Truckee with his three girls and in Wisconsin and has business dealings go, going all over the country, right? He has shoes fit on his white t-shirt because us staters don't wear suits anymore, wears flip-flops, I'll say this, he smokes weed, he can smoke weed. A guy like me can't smoke weed, and he gets to be present raising his three daughters all the time. That's my brother, though. That's not me. You got to learn who you are, and you need to figure out how to be true to yourself. And to me, that means what things are you doing that you shouldn't be doing, and what things aren't you doing that you should be doing. If you want to sleep with peace in your heart and you want to be able to share space with somebody and look them in the eye and tell them the truth based on your personal experience, the less things you have on both sides of those ledgers, per my experience, the more comfortable you'll be in your own skin. The more you'll be able to wear life like a loose fitting garment, so to speak. So I was accumulating DUIs as a banker. I was really good at it. I made a lot of money. I had a big house. I had a BMW 750 Li, you gotta dress the part when you show up, you gotta have the right pen, you gotta get out of the right car. I had an Infiniti QX56, I had a Porsche 911 Carrera 4SC, black on black, graphite package, you know, one for the winter, one for driving to work. You gotta have a sedan and you gotta have a nice sedan, that's the way I was raised, and then a car to drive around for fun. So I was accumulating a lot of stuff. I was getting stock, I was getting six figure bonuses, but there was always something missing, that personal satisfaction. I knew it deep down. And also, I was no good at dealing with life on life's terms. I was, I was always having that energy inside me and my mind turning and I didn't like the way I felt. And I wasn't raised to deal with the way I felt, which is why I drank a drug. And the problem wasn't the drinking and the drug, the problem was me. So I went to rehab twice. I went to rehab, I think, after my third DUI when I was 25. The courts told me I had to do it. I went to rehab after my fifth DUI when I was 30. A place called The Meadows in Wickenburg, Arizona. 40 grand, 40 days, one of the top treatment centers in the country. Top finance school in the country, top treatment center in the country. <laughs> huh? So they told me you have cirrhosis of the liver, beginning stages. You see this guy, his skin's yellow and his eyes are yellow. He's jaundiced. Keep drinking. That's what's going to happen to you. They took me in an ambulance to a place, put me in a little uh, zip up, clear package room where they could put some stuff under my tongue to get me to calm down because my injection fraction or my fraction injection, my heart wasn't beating up, beating out enough blood. I was 30 years old, I was 225 pounds, I was in the best shape of my life on the outside, but on the inside, I was dying. I was killing myself. I remember calling my mom, mom, I'm, I'm dying. I'm killing myself, what are you talking about? What, you? Like, you're, you're tough, you're strong. I was dying. So I remember coming back to the bank, I'd been to treatment and I was trying to figure out how to be a part of the workplace. It was my dad or it was my boss. Never knew which one it was going to be. I was trying to do business. I was trying to manage my personal life and my habits, which were getting too hard to carry. And I couldn't talk to anyone about it because if you're in trouble, you keep that in the family. 
We'll talk about it. We'll figure it out. Don't let anyone know, because if they knew, that'd be a sign of weakness. And I didn't want to be portrayed as weak, even though I'd always been scared and somewhat weak on the inside. If you want to put me in a situation like I wound up that I'll tell you about that most people couldn't get out of, I was strong in that way. But when it came to just being okay in my own skin, I've always struggled with it. I still struggle with it. I'm insecure. I have a lot of fear. I can have a lot of anxiety on the inside. I don't believe in taking medications, not that it's not right for some people, but I'm a drug addict. I'm an alcoholic, and it's not okay for me. So I wound up getting a girl pregnant and having a daughter. Every man should have a daughter or a sister, and this little girl, just the most beautiful thing in my life. The first time I've probably ever known true love. And loving that little girl, knowing she loved me, and knowing she was counting on her daddy. This irresponsible, not humble, big ego guy who was killing himself on the outside and on the inside was doing the same, right? Your insides don't always match your outsides, people. That's why it's important how you treat people. That is the most important thing. No one is going to remember where you worked, how much money you made, what your title was. They're going to remember the way that you made them feel. So my life changed overnight one day. Remember, I'm telling you about something that was supposed to happen that didn't take over this bank. I got a seven PUI on my way to work. It was eight and a half years ago. I had a head on collision. I heard another guy who, thank God, recovered 100%. And I cracked three vertebrae in my neck. I fractured six ribs. I punctured both lungs and I fractured my right hip. Went to the hospital. I woke up. Someone was helping me breathe. I couldn't talk, you know, and uh, scared. I remember vividly what happened. I remember driving and nodding out hit this guy head on, SUV, SUV, no seatbelt. And I remember being on the side of that truck. I couldn't get any air. I couldn't breathe. I was scared. But I'm not scared in those situations because normally I kind of know what to do when I'm dealing with adversity because I've had a lifetime that I'm out of adversity. My poor choices, right? That's another thing. We all make poor choices. It is only a mistake if you do not learn from it. I make poor choices every day, but I do not make too many mistakes anymore. So learn from your choices. That represents the truth of an experience. And remember, my biggest failures have been my biggest lessons, my biggest growth. So it doesn't matter if you've fallen down. Remember, the son of man, it matters that you're getting back up and what you do with that. So eight days later, I lost 30, 40 pounds. I exercised a lot. I was taken in a wheelchair facing a one to 20. Right, facing them one to 20. And what's my mind wrapping it around? How many of my daughter's birthdays am I going to miss? And that's hard math to do. That kid who was so good at doing math was his dad. I couldn't make sense of that math. And I also had to go to the isolation unit, the hole. I'm in a metal box 23 out of 24 hours a day. <laughs> they let you out for a half hour in the morning, a half hour at night, in shackles, walking up and down a dark hallway. It's a little slit where they give you your food. I remember I was looking at this cell it was for people who were on suicide watch, detoxing, and not medically fit to be the general, with the general population. And I knew for the first time in my life, I was going into a situation that I could not handle, right? I'd always been scared to deal with myself, be alone with that person. Drugs, alcohol kind of turned it off. But I knew I was going to do something I could not do. And you hear this sometimes, but to me, it was my experience. Something inside me said, help, help me, help me, help me. Acts, adoration, contrition, thanksgiving, supplication. That is not praying. Those are rote prayers. I still say the Our Father. But that relationship I talked about, talking, listening to God, that is what I got the gift to develop. Help me, help me, help me. I'd ask the CEO for a book, something I can read. You gotta do a kite. You're not gonna get it for four days. I'm coming off drugs. My body is mangled. I cannot go be alone in that place, alone, wondering how many of my daughter's birthdays I'm gonna miss, thinking about all the deals that I left on the table, thinking about my reputation and what I've done to my father's reputation. Mark Dare, seven DUIs, methamphetamine, all over the news. 
Help me, help me, help me. Dave, you got a Bible? Thanks. The Bible is called Free on the Inside. Remember, your insides don't always match your outsides. Learn to be free on the inside with yourself. It's the best thing I can give you today. Insides. It's your insides. But I got that Bible. I went in that little space, and I knew four things to be true. One, there was a God. I felt it. I knew it. I knew there was a God. Yahweh, I know you are with me, standing always by my side. You guard me from the foe. You lead me in ways everlasting. Hearing that church song that I hadn't heard in so many years. But I knew it was there. I knew I had a mind. I knew I had a body. I knew I had a spirit. I knew I would be out someday. And I knew if I was the same man that went in, I'd be back. So how do I improve my mind, my body, and my spirit each day just a little bit so I can be ready for that opportunity that God will eventually give me? So I challenge you, what books are you reading right now? What people are you associating with? What are you doing for your mind? It's a muscle. Strengthen it. Exercise it. Your body. Right? A strong body leads to a strong mind. It is a temple of the spirit. If you do not use it, you will lose it. And then your spirit. That talking and that listening to God. What are you doing to be in the moment with God? Be still and know that I am God. So I broke time into 15-minute increments in my head. I exercised with that Bible. Everything I could do. I was weak. I was broken down. I lost 45 pounds in eight days. I was mangled. I read that Bible. I started at the beginning. I've always wanted to read the Bible. Let's read it cover to cover. Maybe this is an opportunity. Someone had told me mindfulness. Space between those two claps. How do you learn to breathe and observe your five senses? Be in that moment. So I worked on breathing. And then I played a golf course I played since I was a kid for 15 minutes. On the first tee, I hit the shot. Go hit the next shot. On a dewy winter or a dewy summer morning, seeing my ball roll through the dew and the rooster tail, being able to see my line, my line. And for those moments when I could get there, I wasn't in that cell. So fast forward six months into county, and it's not good being in county because it's dead time. You're in the same mod. You don't get out to see the sun, the moon, um, and you're just stuck in a spot. You're with a lot of people doing a lot of bad things. I've read more books than I've ever read in my life. I was exercising three times a day. I read a book called A Purpose Driven Life by Rick Warren. And it taught me how to talk and listen to God. And that's Ignatian spirituality. How do we invite God into every aspect of our life? And I was inviting God into every aspect of my life. And I was as spiritually fit as I had ever been in my whole life. I'll fast forward. I got out. Eight months later, someone who was not good at taking care of themselves um, and who was doing high-end foreclosures, buying them and selling them. I know real estate like the back of my hand. I was making some good money, but I was having the people build them out for me. I was trying to do a guy a favor I was locked up with. That guy was a meth dealer. So I got down to 175 pounds. I was up for three or four days at a time. I was losing my touch with reality. I went to dinner, a place called the Venice Inn that is not around anymore, with Father Tom, and I said, I'm dying. I'm dying inside. I got no hope. I, I, I can't believe my life's come to this. I'm on meth. I don't know what to do. He said, well, maybe go somewhere else and try not to think about yourself. Maybe help someone else. There's this place called the Heart Ministry Center next to our church. It's in North Omaha. Like, you think they'll let me, do, you think they'll let me come? I'm a fellow. I'll let you come, he said. So I met this guy named John Levy, who was the executive director at the time. He's the head of the Bill and Ruth Scott Foundation now. He gave us $1.5 million, which was a leading gift for this building I'm going to tell you we wanted to build. But we talked and we hit it off, and he said, yeah, you can come down and volunteer. Right? There were four employees at the time. We were going through 300,000 pounds of food, and we'd have about 275 families come through. So I went in, and I was so scared, and this lady named Miss Leticia says, you see those cans? 
put them on that shelf. I think everyone wants to have a purpose-driven life and spend themselves on some sort of worthy cause. Purpose-driven life and to spend themselves on a worthy cause. They were helping people in need. I could take that can and I could put it on that shelf. So I put one can on the shelf at a time. And then the way my analytical mind works, as I was able to get off of drugs and heal, the Heart Ministry Center is a place of healing, I was able to say, you know what? Why are we putting the cans on the shelf that way? For this reason. Well, if we did it this way, wouldn't it be more efficient, more thoughtful? Yeah. Why are we doing this? I don't know. If you're ever in a workplace or you're doing something and you don't even know the answer to why you're doing it, that is unintentional. You're not getting the most juice out of that fruit. So I ask a lot of questions. Ask a lot of questions when you're in the business place. And as I was asking questions and thinking about the Heart Ministry Center, who was I not thinking about? Me. Me. All my problems are right here. When I'm with you all, thinking about you, how can I be of service? The common good, God's will, a tiny little business in a minute. Man, everything's kind of okay. I'm not afraid anymore. So over time, through that experience, four months later, coming 40 hours a week and being a really hardworking volunteer because I was trying to get clean, which I did, John says, hey, you want a job? My skill set was perfect for that organization, right? I was trying to get mine at the bank, like I named this talk, which I've never done something like that, but you're never gonna get yours in that place. Everyone's trying to get theirs out there. And once you got it, there's something more to get. Three cars, big house, money, what's next? There's always more. It's one I stopped trying to get mine and tried to start thinking about everyone else and this God person who given me life and what he wanted me to do, then I started having things happen around me that I couldn't have planned, that were consistent with God's will, not mine. So we wound up having four people when I got a job. John says, what do you want your title to be? What do you mean what do I want my title to be? You're the boss, aren't you supposed to choose the title? Right, I'm used to doing business in a top-down way one person on top of that org chart there's people underneath and it all goes to here flat organization we don't want titles we don't want names we're all the same we're all spokes on the heart-shaped wheel that is our mission and i'm not used to playing in the sandbox that way i don't know if i'm going to be able to do this i'm trying to compete i'm trying to win i'm trying to be the guy on the new business development report who's number one who's getting the biggest bonus we're going to be thoughtful mark what's it going to be thoughtful we're going to take anyone and everyone into account before we make a decision. What are you talking about? I know the right decision. It's pretty simple. It says, well, it might be that. I don't care about the right or wrong one. I care about being thoughtful and everyone being a part of how does everyone around you feel? And then meeting people where they are. Not head to head, but heart to heart. Everyone's a little bit different. Your coworkers, your customers, the people you're doing business with, they're human beings just like you. Get to know them. Get to know them. If you get to know them, you'll be able to work more effectively with them and for them. So over time, I want to be the relationship manager. Because so I know you got volunteers, you got clients, you got employees, and there's no we, there's you and me, and there's divisiveness. Divisiveness within an organization will kill it will kill it. There has to be a cohesive vision, a cohesive culture, and everyone marching to the beat of the same drummer. So I knew there needed to be some relationship management. Eventually the board wanted me to be the operations director. Look, you're doing some stuff. You need a bigger title. Eventually I was the associate executive director. Then organically something happening through the natural course of things. God's will, always God's will. I get on my knees in the morning because I can have a bad day before I get out of bed. Remember action. Faith without works is dead. Get on my knees. God, please allow me to align my will with yours so that I can see the world through the eyes of love and receive all the gifts from above. Aligning my will with God's, God's will. After John left 
and he wanted me to be the executive director on my review, another guy came in, went to the same school. I kind of had a problem with that. I talked to John. He's like, you wouldn't want the job anymore. It's an administrative job now. You're not an administrative guy. I trusted John. I believed him. Okay. My ego, my ego. Remember that humility thing. God is always watching. God is always watching. How do I make the person next to me better? That's been the one of the biggest things that's benefited me at the Heart Ministry Center. It's doing it and doing it well, like I told you, and trying to make the other people around me better. I fade away. That fear, that anxiety, that doubt goes away, and I'm with you, and we're doing it together. And guess what happens when you make the people around you better? You make yourself better. You can never go wrong doing that. So I would have some talks with God at night and say, this isn't the way it's supposed to be. I'm better than that guy. I'm more capable. I could do that job better. And that didn't really matter. The place had saved my life. The place gave me a chance to be something, be a part of something I believed in. And I knew I'd still be the guy who's stacking cans on shelves. I'd do anything just to be a part of this thing. It doesn't matter what I'm doing. I'll be doing what I'm supposed to be doing when I'm supposed to be doing it. Eventually, I was the associate executive director. Eventually, the executive director called me in and said, hey, you're better at this, this, and this than me. Would you be the chief operations officer? I'll be the CEO. I'll handle the money. I'll handle the marketing. And you oversee our operations. You handle the people. Yeah, I'd love to do that. Thank you. I was kind of doing it anyway. But an org chart, this is business. You got to have an org chart. People need to know who does what and what the chain of command is. Who's overseeing the areas. Everyone's got to be ascribing to that and doing it in the same way that needs to stay in their own lane. A business is only as healthy as the org chart and the people within that org chart who are working. So over time, through God's will, me learning how to get out of the way, be right-sized, be humble, be responsible, we're able to build a new building, right? We went to going from that two to 300,000 pounds of food, 275 families, to 3.6 million pounds of food, to 600 families. Omaha is the second wealthiest set of foundation money in the country behind San Francisco. If you do good work, the foundations will notice and want to support us, build a new building. Okay, I got to write out the design of the building because I was the guy who had the truth and the experience. Remember what I said about working from the ground up? I was the guy who evolved our pantry to be the way it was. And sitting down with an architect and drawing up something and now we're gonna move into it next week's been one of the most surreal experiences of my life. Draw it on a piece of paper, you give it to someone, they kind of revise it. Next thing you know, you're in this building, you're sitting in your office, you're like, how did this happen? I've been at this place for six years. I've been in cubes. I've been in built offices and warehouses that were never supposed to be there. I've been shuffled here and there with my briefcase that my boss and mentor, John Levy, gave me because I still can't drive. It's been nine years and she's been moving all around. All of a sudden now I got this nice office. We're building and are finishing a grocery store style choice food pantry that will be one of, if not the nicest ones in the country. I was able to start a, a job placement program based on my personal experience. Top two reasons were in prison, people were in prison. Top two reasons they came through the door of the Heart Ministry Center, per my experience. Remember, no substitute for experience. God's got a plan. You don't always know how he's going to utilize you. One fragmented, fractured family structure. Nothing healthy to be a part of that involves love and accountability. The second one is lack of education or practical job skills. In any business, you are only as good as your people. We did not have people to run the warehouse. We were growing. I was working hard. I was not working smart. We needed some troops. How do we get those troops? Well, let's develop a job placement program based on my personal experience. I'm helping people out anyway, informally, how do we do it so it's independent of me? How do we do it so it's sustainable? How do we do it so it accounts for those two factors why the people are here? So we can 
have everyone move forward. Our mission is providing food, health care, and a way forward to people severely affected by poverty in the Omaha area so we can put ourselves out of business. And me with that analytical mind who is doing math with his dad, who's knowing it's always business, I was able to develop a job placement program called Fresh Start. So they are the ones who run the center and give us the human resources we needed to grow it. And without them, we are not able to move forward into self-sufficiency. It's a 15 week job placement program for men and women moving forward into self-sufficiency. Who are the people that we wanna work with? We wanna work with people dealing with generational poverty, chronically unemployed, addiction getting into recovery, mental health issues being addressed, gaps in employment, their own general assistants wanna get off, coming out of incarceration, going through the reentry process. Are they a highly motivated person that wants to change, who is honest, who is open-minded, who is willing? Business, remember, we're gonna sign a contract with you. Not so different than the loans I did. There's terms. You're gonna do what you say you're gonna do. We're gonna do what we say we're gonna do. Core values, that's another thing within an organization. Compassion, accountability, community, excellence. Those are the four core values of the Heart Ministry Center. Without compassion, there can be no accountability. Without accountability, you are not able to tell someone the truth based on your personal experience and redirect something. Without excellence, you have nothing. You have nothing. And without community, people are not able to be a part of, to share space together. That is why those are our core values. We sign a contract with you and we agree to pay your bills over the following three months. Help you get your expenses organized, prioritized, and on a consistent basis. You meet with a facilitator once a week to go over your food, your clothing, your housing, your transportation, that cash flow piece. You see a mental health specialist once a week. You go to group therapy once a week. You go to a guided yoga and meditation class once a week. We do credit reconstruction. We do resumes with you. We do mock interviews. We purchase your work clothes prior to earning your job. Open a savings account with a little initial deposit. A checking account to direct deposit your paycheck. We do a predictive index, which is a personality test that looks at your strengths, your weaknesses, any management strategies. And then we meet with you on an ongoing basis to look at your consistency, reliability, work ethic, attitude. Those are four soft skills per my experience in any business that if you can be four for four of those, you will not only not work yourself out of a job, but you will create opportunity for yourself. And we had the perfect work setting, this pantry. We're getting 60,000 pounds of food a week. We're seeing 600 families a week. We empower and we hold people to very high performance standards. That's another thing in any business, empowering and holding people to very high performance standards. If you can be four for four in those soft skills, you will graduate to one of our 29 community employers. And we will continue working with you with the only difference being we are no longer subsidizing your income, it is being generated through earned income. We do what's called a pro forma compensation action plan. We know what your expenses are. We've got them organized, prioritized on a consistent basis. We know the income you're gonna get. I used to bank all these people. I'm coming back sometimes with my tail between my legs, but I loaned you the money to start your business. I've known you for a lot of years. I tell you about this program. Would you give our people a chance to work? Yeah. They're going to give us an opportunity, but if we're not sending them quality human resources, those doors are going to shut. We started with just one business, 29 now, but we look at your income, that out your taxes. We see what that cash flow is going to look like. We cast it out over six months. There's hope in something like that. I learned that from being in prison. You get a dream sheet. It tells you how much time you're going to do and when you're going to get out. And if you can stick to the plan and not get in the way of your good time, you're going to get out. So we give them a dream sheet of, so, of sorts. We meet with them once a month. Bring in your paychecks. You got to be earning that income. Bring in your checking account history to show your discipline to those expenses. At three months, you get $250 for being a part of our graduate group. At a year, you get $500. At two years, you get $1,000. At month four, if it is not an unnecessary hindrance to your cash flow, we will get you an automobile, pay for the licensing as well as the first month's worth of insurance. And we also have a rent program that pays for 100%, 75%, 50%, 25% of your rent to help subsidize your cash flow. 
it is a thoughtful opportunity, and like any other opportunity, it works if you work it. So we have had 54 graduates, 34 are still working. We've had eight working over two years. We've had one working over three years, and we got a lot of momentum built up. So through that momentum, we've had the opportunity to do a social enterprise, right? I went out and visited Father Boyle in Los Angeles after I read Tattoos on the Heart. I read Tattoos on the Heart, and I said, well, how do we do this in a way where we're meeting North Omaha, where it is, four years ago? We got to start businesses. What's a social enterprise? We're creating jobs for our program participants who aren't ready for our community employers, viable goods and services for North Omaha to utilize, and then we want to do multiple social enterprise over time. We're in talks with the guy who just left the room, Dean Hendrickson, as well as talking about doing a trade specific business unit so we can create a cluster of consumer activity so people from other parts of the city will come down, spend money, and connect it to North Omaha. North Omaha is one of the most impoverished areas in the country. One out of every five children do not know where they're getting their next meal. Homicide rate African Americans under 18, number one in the country. STD rate African Americans, number one in the country. Overall poverty rate African Americans, number two in the country. That is in the half mile radius of the Heart Ministry Center. There's not been new construction going on in and around 24th Street there in a long, long time. We just raised $7.1 million. Go check out the building, it's really nice. Let's open a laundromat. Father Boyle, nine social enterprises over 25 years, improves one of the most impoverished areas in LA. Gang members coming out of incarceration, working next to each other who would normally be killing each other. Eight of those are not fiscally responsible. I do not believe in having a social enterprise that is not fiscally responsible. We're preaching self-sufficiency to our clients, so why not figure out one that would be fiscally responsible? Well, maybe we should do those baked goods, right? Highest profit margin of anything out there. We're not gonna get into the tombstone business. <laughs> one day someone says, what about a laundromat? What is the supply? What is the demand? What are the demographics in the area? Who can I talk to who's in the business? Because that felt like a good idea to me. So that's another thing. Copy off of people but copy off the right people. It's gonna have your spin because you're doing it. So I called someone who owned Dundee Bank that I went to prep with. You bake any laundromats? Yeah, talk to this guy. South Omaha, same size of what you're thinking of doing. Relationship, how you treat people, heart to heart, sharing space. He's giving me the financials, showing me the keys to the kingdom. Here's what I learned in doing it. Make these considerations. Okay, who sells you your laundry equipment? Who sells you your, uh, Equipment, the washers, the dryers, it's this Todd Santoro guy. He's a guy who owned laundromats and operated them, but wound up getting into the distribution business, so he had to get out, talk to him. Talking to him gives me the numbers for laundromats in the area based on national averages. How many spins? You know, it's all based on spins. Accounting, do it in a conservative way, conservatism. Sit down with somebody. I used to look at business plans, but I never did business plans. So asking it, uh, an entity through the state to have somebody sit down, it's not NEDCO, that's why I used to loan through, but it's somebody like that going down to UNO and sitting down with this girl, she loves doing financials. So I got to take Todd's pro forma numbers she gave me for national averages, apply them to North Omaha, utilize this girl's expertise in doing Excel spreadsheets and put together one year, two year, three year, five year pro forma financials, projections. Guy I know who's an entrepreneur has a girl who's awesome at doing business plans. She's a consultant. She comes down to the center, telling her about the vision, getting her to do a business plan where as a banker, if you saw this business plan, any question that you would want answered has been answered. You might think it's gonna work or not think it's gonna work, but when you read that, you're gonna say those guys were thorough. That's another thing. If you're starting a business, do your research. Dot your I's, cross your T's. Before you hit a marketplace, make sure you are ready. So six months from now, we will be opening that laundromat. We are creating four jobs. It is called Fresh Start, the name of the job placement program I started. We will have a red neon sign out there. 
and we're really excited about it. $1.2 million of the money we raise is going towards that. It'll be the nicest laundromat in the city. Why should it be the nicest laundromat in the city? It's in the heart of North Omaha. Why is your building so nice? It's in the heart of North Omaha. Why not? Shouldn't it be nice? Mm -hmm. Shouldn't it be nice? And it is. And if we're able to be successful with that social enterprise, we're going to have the opportunity to do multiple social enterprises. We move into our new building next week. I cannot believe it's happening. I cannot believe God utilized me to be a part of it because I am as flawed as any other human, any human being that I have ever met. And something is happening that never should have happened. I'm a part of something. It's allowed me to heal while I'm able to be a part of other people. You cannot give away something you can't. You cannot give away something you do not have, young people. You cannot give away something you do not have, and you cannot keep it if you do not give it away. And that is the common good. It's sharing your experience, strength, and hope with other people. We are all connected in our love, and we are all connected in our suffering. That is the truth of my experience of being at the Heart Ministry Center. So once we move into that building, we're repurposing our existing building, which is right next door and connected into case management offices. We're taking two dental chairs to four dental chairs. We're taking three medical offices to four. And right along 24th Street there, we're going to do our first social enterprise. 24th Street used to be the street of dreams prior to the race riots. So how can we improve it? I got a father who used to be a banker, and he said, you're crazy. You can't ever do anything like that. You can't do a little business unit down there. Are you going to be successful? <laughs> Dad, maybe it's going to take three or four generations to improve this thing. What if we can make it one or two? Wouldn't that be a worthy cause? Something to spend yourself on? By being a part of something you believe in, over time, you can start believing in yourself. Tomorrow is promised to nobody. Tomorrow is promised to nobody. We are all going to die. We are all doing time. What are you doing with your time? Eight hours you're asleep, what are you doing with the other 16 hours? Anything you practice, you will get better at it. And tomorrow is just another today. The time is always right now. Where you go, you will always be, and what you bring is contagious. I ask you, where will you go and what will you bring? I hope it is aligned with God's will. I hope it is in business if that is your choice. I hope you have faith. Remember, faith without works is dead. And be thoughtful. There's other people out there. We're not the only ones playing in the sandbox. Thank you very much. some questions. If you have anything you'd like to ask Mark, good time to do it. So you were in Douglas County Correction Center? Yes, for nine months before I went to Lincoln Correction Center. And at Douglas County, is that where you were in, in isolation? Yes. I go to the Yes. Uh, the only time I got to leave my mob was uh, twice a month. People came down with a, an AA meeting and although we were in orange jumpsuits, people from the outside coming in and sharing their time and going to a, another spot versus being in the mob. It meant so much to me. So I have a lot of respect for anyone who does that. Keep doing it if you get a chance. It means a lot to a lot of people. Good to see that. Yes, ma'am. Uh, what's your experience been like recovering from it? It's just for today. It's one day at a time. Um, it's a program of anonymity, but if anyone <laughs> thinks they might have an issue, um, I could fail in my recovery, so I don't want you to think uh, if I fail, it's, it's, it's negative to the program. The program works if you work it. So I, I, I go to a lot of meetings. I, I, I do exactly what they tell me to do. My best thinking got me seven DUIs in prison. I know I'm a drug addict and an alcoholic. Um, it involves action, it involves steps, it involves meetings, it involves a sponsor. 
and it involves the God of your understanding. Steps two and three are the main steps that get you through all the others. Came to believe that a power greater than yourself can restore your life to sanity. Insanity, doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. And then we made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood him. Let go, let God do the next right thing. My will and God's will, where I'm on. It's God's will, not mine. I'm here to serve. I'm a spiritual being living in a physical world. The only reason I'm here is to prepare my soul for eternity. So God, take with me as you, as you want, and please allow me to serve your will. I'm your humble servant. So specifically, uh, talking about your experience working for a nonprofit, uh, how does that differ from just when you were working in just normal corporate business, and specifically in terms of like, how do you guys get funding? It's like if you look at a business and you're doing a revolver and you're giving them 25% of inventory, you're giving them 80% of under 60 day receivables. And you look at those receivables, bless you, you look at those receivables and the diversity of those receivables determines the strength of that borrowing base and their ability to pay back that revolver. You do not want too much concentration in any one receivable. So we have foundation, no money. Those are receivables or our money coming in is the way my mind intellectualizes it, conceptualizes it. We have businesses, we have churches, we have schools, we have individuals, and we want them to be diversified. We do not want to rely too much on the foundations because they want us to go figure out other ways. Man, the foundations in Omaha, Nebraska, they don't have ways to give out as much money as they're trying to. Bill and Ruth Scott Foundation. John got a billion dollars. It has a sunset clause, and he's got to give it all out. You can give out $60 million in this economy, and at the end of the year, you got more money than you started with. <laughs> you know, that's a good problem to have. But it's about doing good work. If you do good work, the money will follow. And for us at the Heart Ministry Center, look, it was quintessential customer service. We wanted our customers to expect excellence. It's quintessential client service now. We want them to expect excellence. I'm grateful to have been able to be a part of it because it's run like a business. I've gotten more and more of a voice and that's important to me. Look, there's no incentive. I'm not getting a bonus. I'm not gonna make the money. I'm not gonna get the title. Who cares about that? Remember, God's always watching. That excellence piece, right? The, the community, our culture, the compassion and accountability. We run that place like a business. We do it that way because we can, and we hold each other to high performance standards. It's no different than in the business. Now, the bank for banks, $150 million to $300 million was in the top three in the country. Return on assets, return on equity. We had $97,000 in net charge offs in 20 years working there. There was no finance committee. My dad approved all the credits. My dad is good at what he does. If he gives money, the money will be paid back. That's another thing that helped me interest are mutual in that if the business is successful, the business is going to be able to pay it back. You know, so looking at uh, businesses and being able to critically analyze them was something that I'm grateful that I got to learn at the bank. So they are no different. The same fundamental principles apply. Not enough nonprofits are run like businesses, nor do they have as confident of people in there as there should be. Any business who has your ability to have goods and services that are viable, and have a market and a product that people want. But what's equally as important, that's just the outside, right? That 225 pound person who's 30 went to rehab. What do the financials look like? What's it look like on the inside? Because if you don't have those financials right, it's gonna die. So a lot of people don't know how to account for that aspect of the business, whether you're in the nonprofit world or people who are trying to get a business up and off the ground. So know what you know how to do and know what you don't know how to do and get people around you who could do the stuff that you're not good at. And that takes lack of ego and it takes a self-awareness. Don't try and be all things to all people. Any other questions? 
Mark, I can't imagine a better last speaker for our symposium this year. Thank you so much for sharing your story. Very great.